Greetings and welcome to another video and in this one today we're doing another episode of Passion for Games. Joining me as usual is Jeff Sassamisa1806. Hello mate. Hello there. Right now today we are doing an absolute Stonewall classic. We're doing Dungeon Master by FTL. The game that sold a million Atari STs and yet we're doing it on the Commodore Amiga. Yeah, it's kind of amusing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think the only reason I I did it on the Amiga is just because uh, it it runs a bit smoother. It's got better ambience, more colours. It is an all round better game than the ST version was. All oh, right, okay. Well, I mean, I didn't play it a lot on the Amiga. I mean, obviously, as you know, I played it a lot on the ST. I mean, this is. Uh... One of the rare games that I think absolutely near enough everybody had a had a proper copy of rather than a pirate. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I must have played it. I must have played it on and off for probably three years on the ST. I completed it every which way, every character combination, one character, two, three. You know, <laughs> safe for playing it blindfolded. Oh, there's a challenge we might try in the future. Oh, I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, but yeah, um, it's just. I mean, I know that there were like um, a lot of strategic games from like Sierra and companies like that, and you know you had the Gold Box D and D games. But this really brought RPGs to the fore on the computers, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, until I saw Dungeon Master. Around our mutual friend Dean's house, as I recall. Uh, I was playing Star Trek The Rebel Universe at that point, wasn't I? And yep. I was so blown away by Dungeon Master, I pretty much ditched Star Trek at that point. I did come back to that at a later date, and I may well do a playthrough of that at some point. But yeah, it it, it did blow me away, I will admit. You know, I pretty much asked Dean to go over Shepherd's Bush and get me a copy of it. And he yeah. did. He did. I, I know. I went with him, um, <laughs> and very luckily for me, there was a a, a shop next door selling Iron Maiden's latest album on tape <laughs> for for a fiver. So I got that the same day. So it's a trip I remember very well. Yeah, that yeah, eighty eight. That would have been so. Yeah, thirty four years ago. And time fly. Yeah, I was working for Blue Arrow at the time, and when when Dean gave me the game that day. I was like due to work at TJ Poo Parts, which was like a, a fruit years, I think it was. They they uh, bought in the crates of fruit and we basically had to go through them and remove all the ones that got damaged, you know, like bad oranges and that bruised apples and that. Yeah. And I remember sitting in the canteen during the break that night reading through the manual. Yeah, and then I'm pretty sure you loaded it up and didn't turn it off for a long time. <laughs> I mean, you I did think... really go in depth on it. Yeah, I think it's the only game I've ever played for more than 24 hours straight. Bloody hell. I mean, you played Captive a lot, but and, and Diablo 2, as I remember, but nothing has comes close to Dungeon Master, does it? Yeah, this one's definitely over 10,000 hours. You know, it's probably even more than that. I mean, Captive, I can definitively say 10,000 hours plus, but yeah, DM could be as much as twice that. <laughs> Bloody hell. Well, you got your money's worth then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just a shame that the sequels were such a disappointment, but we'll go into that. Yeah, so enter in the dungeon. Pretty sure there's a bit of loading, and it's uh, choose your champions. Have you got a specific team in mind for this? Yeah, uh, one thing I will say straight away is the Omega version was one mega only. You couldn't play it on a half mega mega, uh, whereas the ST version you could. The ST version came on a single sided single sided disc originally. But yeah, the Amiga version, it loads into a full one meg, so no loading between levels like the ST version did. Right, the party I pick are the two strongest fighters, which are Hissa and Hauk. They've got the highest strength. That's Hissa, Hauk, and the two best wizards, which are Chani, who's got the highest wisdom in the game, and Boris, who's got the second highest wisdom in the game. 
go Boris also happens to have the second highest manner in the game as well you notice he's got 31 to begin, or 28 to begin with give him the Chinese moonstone that gives him 31 which means he's now only 4 mana away from 40 you'll see why that's significant when he gains another wizard level right okay also we should add as well um, you're not clicking the uh, the arrow pads like so many of us used to do you're using the keypad aren't you yeah, I actually didn't know about that when I played the original ST version. It was Robbie Lapthorn on my apprenticeship that said, you can use keyboard, by the way. You know, you don't have to move with a mouse. I thought, I didn't know that. He does tell you in the manual, though. <laughs> I just didn't read that part. But yeah, I actually resurrected the characters here as well, you know. notice. I didn't reincarnate them. If you resurrect them, they come back with their original skills. If you reincarnate them, they have their attributes risen a little but they lose all their skills. The reason I went for Resurrection is faster go. Right. Because it means that Hulk, for a start, is a journeyman fighter, which means he can already chop with his sword, which is pretty devastating on the early levels. Chani's already a, a novice wizard. Boris is already an apprentice wizard. So you can cast the very basic spells without any screw-ups, because you don't want to be wasting mana. But the puzzles, the first level pretty much gets you into it. I mean, you notice when I first come down the stairs, it was dark as all hell. Every every place other than the Hall of Champions is dark. Yeah. So that's why I'm carrying that torch initially, because you don't want to be wasting mana. But yeah, the first level is kind of getting you into it. You know, you get to interact with the basic elements of the dungeon, find yourself some basic equipment. Because your champions really do start with very, very meagre equipment. Where is your... I've already fought a mummy. Screamers are incredibly weak enemies. But if you actually cast spells or perform any kind of action while you're actually in melee, the experience you gain is doubled. So make sure you cast all your spells while you're actually being attacked. Well, that's interesting to know. Screamers leave behind screamer slices. I don't bother picking them up here because you, know, you get plenty of food. But as you can see, the two fighters, they will make short work of the Screamers. You can chop through that door with a strong enough fire, which saves you a gold key. That puzzle's quite straightforward. It's just nine touch pads. And if you step on the in the right combination, it opens both grates. But you notice that Chani and Boris, they both restore their mana incredibly quickly. Yeah. This happens to be a later version of Dungeon Master as well. The earlier versions of Dungeon Master, when you rested the bars recovered very slowly. They actually sped it up by 10 times in the later versions. I think I picked up an old copy of DM version 1 uh, car boot sale and it was amazing how much slower it was. <laughs> Almost like it hadn't been optimised. Right, Boris has just gained a wizard level and if you're extremely lucky he will hit 40 mana straight away. Now when you hit 40 mana your mana now goes up three times faster than it did before. Which means Boris will recover his mana incredibly quickly. Chani lags behind, but she's got higher wisdom, so they kind of complement each other. That's a simple puzzle. You just step through the You just step through there and get the key. Yeah. You can't chop through that door. They're simple touch pads that you can weight down. Some touch pads can be weighted, some can't. That that's a message on the wall that says this wall says nothing. <laughs> so, yeah, that's kind of pointless. Yeah, not overly useful. But, yeah, it's getting you into the swing of it here. You're fighting basic monsters, opening basic locks, waiting touch pads. But Hissa and Hauk have got high hit points and high strength, so they make good frontline fighters, whereas Boris and Chani... Uh, make good wizards because of their high manner and wisdom there's a medicinal drumstick there as I call it <laughs> ah, and the bottles um, do you use them to make yeah. health potions and stuff yeah they tell you the two most basic priest spells right there which are uh, cure poison and uh, health potion You'll also note that I'm not cheating here and using fireballs on the first level because you don't know that spell at the beginning. 
That is one drawback of Dungeon Master. If you've played it before, you will know all the spells already, which means you can horribly break the game. I noticed in Lucosa's playthrough, he tried to cast a fireball at the beginning. It's not worth it, because your characters are such poor wizards at this point, you essentially won't get any power out of your spells anyway. But that is one criticism of the game. I know Return to Chaos, which was the PC reimagining, they locked the spell book so you couldn't cast what you didn't know. You had to find the scrolls with the appropriate spell on it. Just like AD&D, isn't it? You can't yeah. cast a fireball or it's a first level mage because you don't know it and you don't have the skill. But you make short work of the early monsters. You notice how I used that spare key so I didn't have to run up that other corridor. Yeah. It saves quite a bit of time. This isn't a speed run by any means. A speed run of this can be done in something like 21 minutes, can't it? Yeah, 21 minutes if you use Stan, who starts with an X. But you know, it's already, Boris is already a novice wizard. Yeah. That quick. So another pre no, novice priest, I mean. Which means he can already cast, like, third-level priest spells. I mean, Chani's lagging a bit, but you can't really help that because she's got lower mana. You notice how I'm also resting in order to speed up the combat. Yeah, I was going to ask why you was doing that, because I was thinking that's lot, not long enough to get their stats back up. But yeah, I was say it's to speed the combat. Well, that's fair. That door there, it just says none shall pass. Uh, as long as you've got a fairly strong fighter with more than about 45 strength, anyone can chop through that door. That just gives you a couple of extra bowls. That's uh, this fan and accepts one wish. Opens a door for you. Uh, the Omega version lets you drink at the fountains automatically. You don't need a water skin. The ST version, you had to use the water skin to drink. Yeah, I, that's, that's, I mean, the ST version is a version I've played. I've never really played the Omega one. I mean, I did have it, but... Um... I only had a bent copy of it, so I didn't have any any like rule books or anything. Yeah. Well, that switch I just pulled opens up another grate, which opens, which gives you access to another falchion, which you don't need. Uh, which gives you your first blue magic box. Blue magic boxes don't last very long. About ten seconds, I think, if that. They come in handy in certain places. I mean, the falchions are surprisingly good weapons at the start. If you use reincarnated characters, you haven't got chop on them, though, because you need at least an apprentice wizard to chop, uh, apprentice fighter to chop. So you're better off with a clubs, because a club requires no skill to use at all. Anyone can bash with a club. Uh-huh. But, yeah, the falchions are simple falchions, depending on how you pronounce it. They are quite good swords at the beginning of the game. So make use of them. This Screamer here has got more health than all the other Screamers on the level. I think it's got about three or 400 hit points, so it takes a few more chops. But it does no more damage. I don't bother with the throwable weapons, because they're a pain to pick off the floor. You know, we literally had to wait till Grimrock, you know, <laughs> before it would auto-pick things off the floor for you. Yeah, I remember our, uh, our ecstatic. <laughs> it was the first time you played Grimrock. Yeah. And you're like, I walked over a rock and it picked it up. Yeah, I was quite impressed with that mechanic. That's a lot of mummies. Yeah, you get like six or seven of them here, I think. Again, they're not much of a threat. You know, one good chop. You know, and they're down. You know, so my characters automatically turn to face there because I've got attack from the side. Yeah. The shields give you a percentage chance to evade, but to be honest, it's not enough to really warrant bothering with shields. You're better off just to stick bottles in their hands. Well, the bottles and the magic boxes are all very useful. There's no sense in carrying chests. They're way too heavy, and that will drain your stamina very quickly. Now, it's bad enough carrying the armour. I stick with torches for the minute because I need the, the mana for priest spells until I get up to about journeyman priest. Because once you're a journeyman priest, they can both cast 
low level poison spells, which are very useful on this next level. Oh, I know. In fact, something Lucosa didn't point out in his playthrough is poison in this game is very effective against living monsters, far more effective than fire or lightning. So on the early levels, if it lives, poison it. I'm sure he'll be ecstatic, you're pointing out his shortcomings. <laughs> well, I mean, I've seen the stats for the... Uh, I've seen the stats for the monsters. I, I've deconstructed the game <laughs> over the years. So, right, this level, you need at least five keys to get it. Well, you need four keys to escape the level. You need five keys if you want all the goodies. Now, essentially, there's six doors here, so... Well, choose which ones you want to do. This one has no no enemies in it at all. It's got a hidden shield in that location. See, some walls you can walk through. Yeah. Again, when I first played the game, I didn't know that. You well, you wouldn't. Oh, that's a saber, which is actually better than a falchion. Yeah, there are spinners in here. It's called the Matrix for a reason, because there are spinners which turn you through 90 degrees. If you carry the compass in one of your hands, you can see it turning, and it gives it away. This is time is time is of the essence. Ever lots of time puzzles here. I click that button quickly, throw that, and it shuts up here. Click that quickly, back up before the hole opens. That shuts the hole again. There's some trollings. Again, they're no threat. One good slash, dead. <laughs> Hisser's got 63 strength to start with, so he will hack things to bits. Yeah, they just look more impressive than what they are. Yeah. I mean, the party that Lucosa chose, to be honest, it was a very poor combination. I mean, just because a character starts with lots of armor doesn't make them a good fighter. You know, you want characters that have got high strength and high hit points. I mean, he chose Dado and Gothmog. Gothmog's not a bad wizard. Nope. But he didn't take the Cloak of Night off of Gothmog and put it on Daru in order to improve his dexterity. And Daru starts with the worst dex in the game, which means he's going to miss constantly and get hit a lot. Got the highest health in the game, though. 100 health. And fairly high strength. But you notice I can already melee with that, with the uh, Sabre. Yeah. Because Hulk starts as a journeyman, journeyman fire. These mummies are a bit tougher. Well, but not didn't, much. didn't look that tough. It looked like he was trying to run away. But yeah, one good melee and they're down. And just, the potions can take care of any injuries. I mean, Boris does tend to drain his stamina a bit now because the more money you've got, the faster it drains your stamina as you rest. Yeah. But yeah, now you've gained a few priest levels, you can now do second level poison. Poison foe, I think was the proper name for the spell. I used to just call it poison bolt. Give Chani a moonstone back now. So she's got a bit more mana. One good melee dead. Just out with poison, all dead. And no threat whatsoever. They've literally got zero resistance to poison. I mean, you can even just sort of throw clubs at them if you want. Throw heavy objects at them and they will die. But that won't give you any experience. You're better off to use your weapons because you need your fighter levels. Yeah. Yeah, your fighter levels are extremely important. I mean, these enemies are not much of a threat, but the next level, you get your first really tough enemy. And if you ain't got your fire levels up, you can't get through their armor. There's no good throwing objects at them because it won't do any good. But that one was called the Creature Cavern for a reason, because it was literally full of monsters. This is Chambers of the Guardian, I think, this one. You see Chani's yeah. struggling to do those second levels at the moment because she hasn't got very much in the way of mana. Yeah, this is James of the Guardian, this one. Another medicinal drumstick. Nope. Always take the drumsticks. They're worth about 50% food, so. Mm 
Yeah, didn't go well for them, did it? <laughs> yeah, these rock monsters, very high armor, no poison resistance at all. And they're very weak against punches. Which seems odd, but yeah, your weapons will not get through their armor. Not unless you've got an incredibly strong weapon. You know, you typically need a, an axe or bell. But yeah, this one, you just teleport the chest between the cells and eventually it will come outside the cells. It's not random. But yeah, the back characters concentrate on your wizard and priest levels. Front characters concentrate on your fire levels. Again, it's using all four characters as a unit. That's the mirror of dawn which you used to open that eye. Yep. Oh, how took a bash bash in there. <laughs> yeah, he's got his chest exposed, hasn't he? <laughs> Walking around with his manly chest out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, typical barbarian. No. 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 Yeah, cover that up with some uh, leather, isn't it? I mean, the armor is uh, the same as AD and D. It's uh, got a percentage chance of something just doing no damage at all or doing less damage. Yeah, I just remember the amount of um, like depth in the game with all the characters' stats. You know, I'd not. I suppose for us it was coming from the Commodore 64 to the ST. All right, there was a drop in sound quality, but in graphics and loading and memory and that, you know, it, it made a huge difference. And this seemed so in-depth and complex, and you're running around in, like, first person as well. Yeah. Just such a step up. I know. You get people nowadays, I've seen it on, on other people's playthroughs of this game, and I say, like, oh, I don't see what's so special about it. Back in 87, this just blew us away. Yeah, it did. The computer's just... I mean, you're not going to get Unreal in 1987. <laughs> Computers simply didn't have the power. Well, that one's a simple weight trap. This one's called the vault because lots and lots of doors to get through. Right. Lots and lots of trollings in here. They're all extremely weak, though. So one good chop's usually enough to take them down. Or one, one good melee. Just have a bit of a kip until they come and find you, then, yeah? Yeah, basically. It gets your mana back up. I mean, he can already do three, five, ones, which is enough to pretty much knock these monsters dead with one shot. I mean, rock monsters are surprisingly immune to fire, so it's a waste of time using fireballs on them. But you don't know that spell at this point anyway, so you really shouldn't be using it. So it just kills them instantly. A few punches, dead. <laughs> Bloody hell. Uh, that's a wand. That'll give you the ability to heal a certain number of charges, and it gives you a little bit of extra mana as well, which Shani could really do with. Hang on to the copper coins. You'll need them later. The silver coin's useless. Don't need it. I mean, you have to wait for Skull Keep before you got shops. Right. Which was two games down the line. Well, everyone's pretty much got leather now, which is standard. There's no point in equipping armor on the rear characters at all. They're not strong enough to carry it, and you rarely get attacked on the rear characters anyway unless you get surrounded, which you shouldn't, though. Try not <laughs> to let the enemies flank you or get behind you because they will pulverize your party. It's that kind of game. It's not quite as unforgiving as dungeon, uh, Captive or Nightmare. Nightmare, they call you, you're dead. Yeah, you know, you blink and you're dead. But Dungeon Master, yeah, you don't really want something nasty cornering you. you know, that one teleports out across the pit and you have to throw it back. I mean, step right up going down, it says on the door, uh, on the wall, you know, simply because they want you to not notice the pit reopened and step into it. Yeah, again, just give it a poison spell and then just punch it to death. Punches give you ninja levels, but ninja levels are very underwhelming in this game. I'm surprising that I'm surprised they didn't put critical hits in it like they did with games like Bane of the Cosmic Forge. 
I mean, ninjas in Bane of the Cosmic Falls are lethal because they can literally critical hit and kill something with one hit. But no critical hits in this. So ninjas, very underwhelming. I don't tend to use them. Well, I mean, I suppose this is being like pretty much the first of its kind. It's going to be the, the most basic in its mechanics, I suppose, with things like that. And then obviously people have added to it. I mean, when you look at stuff like the Eye of the Beholder games, you know, there was the, all the Dungeons and Dragons rules and even more stuff in that. So this is probably a, this type of dungeon crawler in its simplest form, but it's anything but simple. <laughs> it's a very complicated game when you actually... I mean, I think when my ST, I say broke, I blew the bloody power supply up, didn't I? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, I mean, James dropped the damn thing while he was in a foster care, and it damaged the power switch, and... I think one night it was really bugging me the way it kept going on and off and I stupidly bridged the fuse with a screwdriver and it sparked like hell and blew the transformer to pieces <laughs> that cost me 63 quid to get repaired <laughs> but yeah during the time my ST was actually getting repaired I actually wrote uh, I think like 30, 32 page document or something all about this I suppose it was a fact but I actually wrote it out on paper you know no, I literally wrote down the way all the stats work, the way all, how all the all the things recuperate, the strengths of all the monsters. Deconstructed the whole game. I think I've yeah. still got it somewhere. No. Yeah, I think I've still got the sketches Dean once did, you know. You know, when we were mapping out some of the levels. I mean, now I know the game off by art, but at the time... Uh, the rabbit's foot increases your luck, which means the monsters will miss you 5% of the time. Yeah, it's not too shabby, is it? I mean, everything in this game has a luck factor to it when you try to cast a spell. You know, if you're trying to cast a spell that's too difficult for your current wizard level, there's a percentage chance you might succeed. And the rabbit's foot improves that. I've always wondered about a lucky rabbit's foot because I mean let's be honest this wasn't very lucky for the rabbit was it <laughs> Boris actually starts with one of those so if you want all four of them you do have to have Boris in your party but he's already a journeyman wizard I actually did say in the description I'm surprised no one's called called me out for it that Boris is the best wizard in the game technically Gothmog has got one more wizard level he starts as a journeyman wizard but Boris He's only slightly behind. As he's, I think he's uh, a couple of spells shy of a journeyman wizard, but Boris has got a lot more mana and a lot more wisdom. So overall, he is the better wizard. Yeah, I mean, I've never really researched the characters. I mean, I used to use this sort of party when I played the game because that's what you did, and you were good at it, and I wasn't. So it's like, well, if, if, if you know... If Jeff's using that kind of party, that must be the way to go. So this is this is pretty much the same party that I used to use. And I used to play it on the ST. But that was your fault. Party. Yeah, it's not the party me and Dean started out with. We nope. started out with... Nope. We started out with Dado, Hauk, nope. Wolf, and Tiggy, I think. Because they had the highest health and stamina, uh, health and mana. But it turns out the health and mana are not that important. It's the secondary stats, strength and wisdom that are more important. I know Lucosa actually, uh, he made a snarky comment about Tiggy. A lot of people don't realise that Tiggy is actually a woman. Yeah. From the portrait, you get the impression that it's a, a little short, short hobbit-like guy. But no, Tiggy is actually a woman. If you look in the stats of the game, yeah. it tells you the sex of the character. And Tiggy is actually female. But I knew that anyway from playing uh, Dungeon Master Nexus. You can clearly see from her portrait, because the Japanese have obviously made them all cutesy, haven't they? Yeah. You can clearly see Tiggy's a woman. But yeah, Woof's uh, the best priest in the game, and I think the best ninja. But starts with very, very poor wisdom. So, an okay character to start with. Starts with very high mana. In the second highest in the game after Tiggy. Tiggy does start with the highest mana in the game and the worst health and stamina, which means she eats a lot. She's a very difficult character to play. 
Yeah, these two trollings here are actually uh, stronger than all the others in the, on this level. They do hit you quite hard, but they are protecting a fancy sword. So grab that. I mean, I got my first lot of mail there. Which I chucked on one of the front characters. Right, the rock monsters on this third level, as it says in, on that inscription there, prepare to meet your doom. These enemies are a lot stronger. They hit a lot harder. Yeah, you, you walk down the sword. Uh, you walk down the sword. I mean, you walk down the stairs carrying your sword it, rather than actually having it in the hand. So it's, it's almost like you was expecting that rock monster. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's just convenient to do that, and then you can do some punches and then put the sword back in their hand. But the enemies here are a lot stronger now. I mean, this is where the game, well, this is where a lot of people encountered serious problems, because up to this point, you could pretty much just throw things at the monsters and they would die. But from this level onwards, that's not going to work anymore. Well, it certainly don't work against the rock monsters. It just does no damage. That's why I don't bother with bows or or slings or anything like that because missile weapons are really useless in this game. Yeah, give out, give help the axe. I mean, he's got sufficient levels now where he can actually uh, melee with that as well. So now you've got the two strongest attacks, which you're going to need in a minute. I mean, ninja levels are only really useful just to get your dex and your your health and stamina up a bit. But it is a shame if they didn't include the critical hits or maybe made the ninjas a bit more proficient with bows and stuff like that. But no. Yeah, it would have been interesting if they'd have um, made the ninjas quite proficient with... Um... With, with thrown weapons, you know. Yeah. So, so that way you do have had a reason to use the shurikens and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. They're certainly uh, more useful in uh, the Grimrock mod because Grimrock did have critical hits. Right, just lure these under the door and just freeze them. And then just, <laughs> just, just wait till they die. I mean, rock monsters are so slow and stupid. Oh, I fired on the wrong side of the corridor there. Eh? Swap my characters around the other way. <laughs> <laughs> you have to remember which side each one's on. But yeah, just mash them under the door. I know James said recent. James said a while back on the phone when he watched my playthrough, he said, I'm not trapping them under the door. I thought we had cheating. I said, yeah, you can't do that in Grimrock, can you? They didn't put that mechanic in. No. But you could do it in Eye of Boulder as well. You could trap them under the door and just smash them with the door. In a captive, I think you could do the same thing as well. I mean, yeah, it's a bit cheap, but it's, you know, it's a good mechanic. It's in the game, so it's not cheating. It does tell you that in the manual. You know, basically, use the dungeon to your advantage. You know, if there's a pit, drop the enemy down it. You know, it'll kill them. You know, if there's a door, smash him under it. Right, there's a wasp. These are extremely difficult to hit with weapons because they've got practically 255 dexterity. So, not much point in attacking them with weapons, just shoot them with... They have got zero resistance to poison. It's spare key there. Don't need it, though. Right, now you get the monster that causes people a lot of grief when they first play this game. They see oh, the purple worms. The worms. <laughs> yeah, these have got very high armor. They poison and they do hit quite hard. If you haven't got melee at this point, you're not going to get through their armor. But yeah, as you can see, I make short work of them. They're very weak against poison again, even though they poison you. Just because, you know, just because they poison doesn't mean they can't be poisoned. They drop worm rounds, which yeah, takes all four and give you no food. The old, the old classic worm rounds. Yeah, it's a joke me and James used to make for years about McDonald's hamburgers. <laughs> Wait, M McDonald's hamburgers are 100% beef. I mean, it might be beef from a thousand different cows, but it is beef. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, awful burgers, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sometimes glad I'm a vegetarian. To be fair, though, they did taste good. I mean, even I can't argue with that. 
I mean, seriously. I think they, I've, I've heard that in so many things. Probably the Simpsons family guy. You know, if they didn't want, if they didn't want humans to eat meat, why'd they make it taste so good? It's all got a bit yeah. dark, isn't it? Yeah, the lights. I mean, I'm using a uh, still burning torch. I'm using burning uh, magic torch spells now because it's just more convenient than torches. Plus, I yeah. need my hands. Well, I haven't got any free hands now. Yeah, you, know, you basically want maximum. Well, there's a spare drumstick there and another. There's items hidden all over the place on this level if you can find them. But yeah, it made short work of those worms. As long as you've got melee on your two front fighters and you've got poison spells, you can handle them. There's a couple of scrolls here. Oh, there's a ghost. Very well, weak there ghost. Was, yeah, there was a ghost. <laughs> yeah, they told you we can, yeah, they told you to weaken non-material spell uh, on the previous level, so you shouldn't have any trouble there. You can run round him anyway. You can't run through him. Uh, in Skull Keep, you could run through the ghosts. They would still attack you, but you could run through them. They were literally non-material. No. You're non-corporeal. Running a bit low on water there. No. No. Basically, if any one of those bars goes into the yellow, your stamina starts going down really quickly. If it reaches no. the red, no. you will die. You know, it will drain your stamina no. to zero, and then it will take your health. So keep the bars up. No. Obviously, the more you do, you know, the faster the bars go down. Yeah. It's depending on your stats as well. If you've got a high vitality, you lose. You use your food slower. Uh, if you've got very high uh, mana, you will use your far, m food a lot faster. That's why Tiggy, Tiggy is the biggest pig in the game. <laughs> she burns up food stupidly quick for a very small character. That's, yeah, see, that's, guy, yeah? that's the sort of depth I was on about. You know, you, you've got so many things to watch. You've got your main bars on this yeah. screen, then you've got your food and your water bar on your um, inventory screen. It's just, there was just so much in it. Uh, it, it was a game I mean, to be honest with you, I'm I'm surprised it sold as well as it did because, you know, there was a lot of people that I knew, and I'm sure you did as well, that uh, give them anything more than a fire button and space invaders, and, that, you know, they didn't want to know about it because they didn't think it was a video game, whereas this required so much thought, so much thinking yeah. and planning and, and learning. I'm really surprised it did as well as it did. Cool. I know Carl wasn't a fan of it, was he? He said, oh, it's all just boring grey walls. But Jay was like, he liked it. He wasn't very good at it. But he said he did like the game. Yeah, I kind of got into an argument with Carl over that. I said, the only reason you don't like it is because you can't play it. <laughs> all right, fair comment. I'm not good at every game. I'm terrible at driving and puzzle games. Except for Outrun, I suppose. I suppose I was wizard at that. But that was mostly a competition with Dean English, by. I mean, competition generally, well, it brings out a side of me. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> I, I was just thinking, I just, just imagine the look on Cole's face when you when you said that. It's because... Um, you know, Jay I mean, had to kind of break it up. It's like, oh, you know, people like all different games. Knock it off, you two, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you've never had a filter, have you? You've always said what you're thinking, so... That's it. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not a lefty. I'm definitely not on anything, either, to be honest. <laughs> I've always been apolitical. If you don't like it, I've got much the same attitude that Wayne had. If you don't like it, don't talk to me. Yeah, that's fair enough. I mean, I was hardly one of the popular kids in school, was I? Uh, but they did all know about my prowess for computer games. You know, it was something I was... I suppose if I'd been born 20 years later, I probably would have been doing all that League of Legends and, you know, eSports and all that. I mean, I, would, I couldn't do it now. No oh, way. I ain't got the reactions. Trap these under the door. Make short work of them. Oh, he got away. <laughs> Temporarily. Oh, that worm's had enough. He's trying to run off. <laughs> I get the feeling, and I'm right, that you're not going to let him go. 
Right, dump the saber and have a rapier. The rapier is slightly better. That's got thrust on it, which is... You notice I'm not bothering to cure the poison. The poison's extremely weak in this game. You know, it's not like AD&D. AD &D, you get poisoned by those giant spiders, you know, in EOB, and you die quickly. But in this, yeah, not so much. Well, that's a spare uh, vitality potion, another medicinal drumstick. Yeah, a couple of screamers appear behind you. They're trying to pinch you. But the truth is, the monster that appeared at the other end, a rock monster, is so slow, <laughs> you're unlikely to get into any real trouble here. Eh? These screamers are fairly tough. They're almost like rubber screamers. That bloody noise they make. Yeah, they're called shriekers in AD&D, aren't they? This does tend to be a fairly quiet game and when you're doing the first level and you come across the first screamers if you're yeah. not expecting the sound it doesn't half make you jump <laughs> yeah yeah you got those in Icewind Dale shriekers they made an horrible noise in that game I used to hate them they don't actually attack you they just summon uh, myconids and all kinds of other horrible bloody mushroom monsters but yeah I mean you get a bit more ambience in the Amiga version you notice you can hear the mummies walking around in the background and stuff like that yeah. But yeah, this one again, just trap them under the door, batter them to death. You know, they make short work of them. We'll get some more mail there. The elven boats that uh, ups your carrying capacity a bit. That's stick good it on for one the weaker of, characters, isn't it? Yeah, give it to one of the weaker characters. I mean, the bottles, you might think, why are you picking all them damn bottles up? <laughs> Comes in handy later, as you'll see. Now, I could have avoided the trigger for those worms there. It's right in the centre of that room. If you actually walk around the outside of the room, worms don't trigger. There's lots and lots of traps that you can't actually see. But yeah, for the extra experience, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Spoken like a true vegetarian, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> well, the screamers are plants, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the screamer cage, or th that's what we used to call it. Basically, screamers will regenerate constantly every time you walk past that. There's a trigger on the floor where that junction is down the corridor, and it will keep generating screamers forever. So you could sit in this cage and just keep fighting monsters forever if you wanted to and keep getting your levels up. Well, I do a little bit of training here. You notice I've now stuck the two wizards at the front, and we're quickly getting them a couple of cheap fire levels and ninja yeah. levels. That's yeah, just farming, isn't it, basically? I don't do very much of this, though, because you only need a couple for each character. I mean, Chani's already got a fair number of fire levels, and Boris has already got a fair number of ninja levels. So just get them the opposite. It's good for Boris because his stamina is terrible, and you can't have his stamina keep bottoming out later on because his spells as they get stronger and stronger it will burn his food up in seconds you don't want that you've also got enemies that can area affect your pie and you don't want your wizards you know dropping on you no and at the moment you're still dealing with enemies that cannot reach your rear ranks they can only attack your front characters but yeah you notice the levels are coming thick and fast I should also mention that the speed your levels go up at is also influenced by the level you're on. As you go deeper, you get a kind of multiplier. When you reach level 3, the worm level I'm on now, it's really level 4 because Toll of Champions is level 1. But when you reach this level, you get 1.33 times as much experience. Okay. Well, this is a, uh, a top tip for anyone watching for... Um... You know, getting some uh, getting some levels and with a multiplier on. So, yeah, as you go deeper, it's not the monsters that are giving you experience; it's your actions. You know, whether you're fighting, swinging a sword, punching, casting a spell, you know, making a potion. They're the things that give you levels in this. Very different from AD and D, where it's when you kill monsters, find treasure, disarm traps, and all that stuff, and it depending on the game you're playing or yeah. in the case of tabletop depending on your DM no. I know I keep no. calling it AD&D &D, everybody but that's what I know it as <laughs> no. 
you know, for me, it never de-evolved into D and D. I mean, I'm a second edition guy, partial third edition. Yeah, that's always been my favourite. Right, some foot mail there. He's pretty much got mail all over now. You've got a fair few drumstick uh, in the ranks there, and all, haven't you? Yeah, it's worth picking the drumsticks up. They're light, and they give you a lot of food. I mean, most of the other food is either too heavy, like cheeses. They give you a fair amount of food, but they're heavy. So stick with the stuff that's light that gives you a fair boost. I mean, water, you can fill the bottles as well, but usually the uh, water skins with which I found four. Now, it's generally enough to keep you going. Obviously, it helps me knowing where I'm going. I'll pick that bow up. You do need the bow for a puzzle. You can use it if you want as a, as a missile weapon. Right, this one says, like, uh, this is my prisoner, let him suffer. You, you can kill him. He's literally got one hit point. You can kill him with anything. You killed him with no a drumstick. <laughs> yeah, but notice on the other side. Yeah, I always do stupid stuff like that. You know, basically, uh, the message that appeared on the other side of that pit says, you will suffer, you will regret that. Uh, you now have to fight four lots of worms. Yeah, four, four double sets of worms. You notice the worms always appear in doubles as well. Yeah. You never get single worms. In the Return to Chaos mod, the worms could split up, which I think actually made them easier to fight. Because, I mean, when you've got a double set, it means you're going to get two attacks on your party, so both characters are going to get whopped. Because the monsters always attack the character that, that, the, well, the side they're on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in Grimrock, sense. no, they changed that. They can attack the adjacent character as well. Really? I didn't know that. I thought it was still um, each side. No, and... uh, yeah, Grimrock's kind of sneaky for that. Some enemies can also attack the rear ranks as well, not just with missile weapons. Yeah, I mean, Grimrock... I mean, to be honest, I think Grimrock is probably a little bit harder than Dungeon Master, but if you've played Dungeon Master before you're going to be able to get straight into it. Yeah, I mean, I know you um, you were fairly you know, waxing lyrical about uh, Grimrock when it first came out, but Grimrock 2, was that you weren't so taken with that one, or was it the yeah, other I way around? I wasn't taken with that. It's the only game I've ever bought on a pre-release <laughs> in my entire life. The only game I've ever... You know, bought and pre -release. I thought, well, it's going to be like Grimrock, isn't it? It's not. It's going to be pretty much Cow Strikes Back to Dungeon Master. So yeah, it signed up for the pre-release, and then when it came out, I thought, well, the graphics are nice. That was about all I could say about it. You know, I actually thought it was a, a bit of a downgrade from the original Grimrock. I think one of the problems with it is just like with Cow Strikes Back, because the game is it allows you to go where you want a degree of randomness it means that you, you can very quickly break the game once you realise where all the good stuff is I mean Dungeon Master you're steadily progressing down the levels you can't jump to level 12 yeah uh, with Cal Strikes Back once you know where to go you can very quickly break the game I think you can speed run the Cal Strikes Back in about 16 minutes bloody hell quicker but this level, you don't need to do. This level is entirely poisonous monsters, except for these two screamers here, which don't regenerate. But this level is the treasure stores. Now, if you've already picked up all the key items on the levels you've done already, you can comfortably skip this level out. But I'd do it anyway for the experience. But yeah, lots of poisonous monsters, yeah? Does the... Um poison on the party members ever go away if you leave it, it does. like it does yeah, after right. a while yeah unlike uh unlike uh what was it uh dm java dm java the rear match it's a very good game dm java uh he made the poison very strong right it's a crowd straight out of uh south american mythology in it uh was the incan mythology in it or was it uh mayan it's one of the two. Could be either. That might be Aztec, actually. 
<laughs> yeah, I think it's, yeah, I think it's Aztec. I'll tell you what, if you say every South American uh, yeah, civilization, yeah. you'll get it right eventually. <laughs> yeah, they do bike. They do bike quite a bit out of you. you know, even through armor, they will take 100 health out of you. So you know, I've only got about 146 there. These doors can all be chopped through. But yeah, you want to grab all the uh, valuable treasures here. I mean, you need a blue gem, a bow, the mirror, and a gold coin, at least. Don't bother with the poison darts. These slimes here, they're basically just screamers, except for they poison you, and they do whack you a bit harder. But they chuck poison at you. They don't drop food when they die. A bit of a lazy monster, I think, to be honest. They sometimes drop them potions. Uh, that's a third level, that one. If you've got a high enough wizard level, you can identify the artifacts you pick up and it will tell you more about them. Right. Otherwise, you're left to guess. I mean, in Skull Keep, it did actually tell you the number of charges on the items as well. They didn't put that in Dungeon Master or Chaos Strikes Back. I mean, Chaos Strikes Back did add the magic map, but only the Amiga version. The ST version didn't have it. Cow Strikes Back also didn't come out on the PC. What was the PC version of this like? I don't recall playing it. A bit sparse on the sound. I think the sounds are... It doesn't have the ambience. But it's not too bad. I'd say it was a little less colourful, but a little smoother on the movement. And the PC being faster. Grass that gives you slightly more priest levels. While you're doing this um, sort of bonus level then, let's have a, a quick sort of talk about the other versions of Dungeon Master because you've mentioned a couple. You've mentioned Nexus. You've mentioned some of the follow-ups. It come out on a lot of machines eventually, didn't it? It did. I think it's on the ST. Uh, the original Dungeon Master is on the ST Amiga PC, uh, the Super Famicom SNES. Uh, the FM Towns, weren't it? Uh, yep. X68000. Yeah, it came out on a lot, a lot of machines. I mean, the Japanese versions, I had a go at the FM Towns version, which is identical in every way. It's even got some nice music playing in the background. Obviously, it's got Japanese text, but the FM Towns has got annoying mouse acceleration and you cannot turn it off and it makes it really hard <laughs> to actually click on things. Uh, the Super Nintendo version, it's a bit cut down, probably because of cartridge limitations. But again, it's got the ambient music, and it plays very much the same. Uh, it also came out on the uh, PC Engine as well. It's called Theron's Quest. But it was very... I suppose it was modular, because you had, like... Instead of having the game as a whole game that you went through, you had kind of multiple quests... And you actually like do them one after the other, oh, but right. you you lost your characters and experiences and your items each time you attempted a new quest. So I couldn't get into that. For one thing, no mouse support at all, and it's really hard playing with that controller. It makes the game incredibly slow paced because they had to really tone it down because you well you can't react quickly. So, very disappointing. Had a nice intro, though. I remember you showing me um, Dungeon Master Nexus. Is that on the Saturn, that one? Yeah, Saturn version. I've now got that, to throw that up. Yeah, but you, you did it at sort of like double the speed, didn't you? Because it's uh, really I think it's 150%. Yeah, 150% on the emulator, I think it was. Yeah, it's painfully slow, the original. So I chuck the speed up, <laughs> make it a bit more playable. I mean, it's not cheating, is it? I mean, the game's just running quicker. I used to do the same with the Wonder Boy games. You know, Wonder Boy, Monster Monster World 3 and 4, I used to play them at like 200% normal speed because they were so slow and boring. <laughs> but yeah, Nexus weren't bad at all. It's a very nice reimagining. It's just a shame that we never got it in the West. You know, Victor only released it in Japan. Yeah, well, if 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 I can be asked, which is what it boils down to, I, I might 
you might have seen some of those versions up while we were talking. <laughs> I'll try and remember. It means I've got to record a few things, but I'm sure I can manage that. Yeah, this bit here is, there's lots of traps here. If you walk into certain locations, it will open walls and let monsters out. If you don't want to do that, avoid the, the, the traps, but you'll miss out on the items. Oh, there, I've got the Staff of Claws. That's the Illumilit. It's funny, Dean used to call that the Immulit, but you can clearly yeah. see it's the Illumilit. <laughs> I used to say it wrong as well. That's quite a strong crowd, all that one. But at this point, you notice I can do fifth level poison spells now, which pack a real punch. Yeah. But poison's very easy to cast in this game compared to fireballs. I mean, you could cast fireballs at this point if you want, but it takes more mana. Well, this is a sea of holes, this is. Not random. The holes do open depending on where you step. Obviously, I know the exact route. Yeah, he made that look far too easy. If you fall through, you end up in a room where it's got a message on the wall saying, ha, 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 and there's a drumstick down there and a bottle, and <sighs> then you use the teleporter to go back up and try again. If you fall through a hole, it will take 40 health off of each of your characters, which is enough to kill your wizard's early game. Especially Tiggy. Tiggy only starts with 25 health. So, yeah, avoid falling down holes until you're actually ready to do that. Or you find the rope. You know, the rope will allow you to go down a floor with taking no damage. But not oh, two oh. floors. But two holes, one, one above the other, you will fall through and take damage. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is about as far as I ever got in DM when I used to play it. And I didn't yeah. know this level was optional. <laughs> well, if you found the items you need, you can cool. comfortably skip it out. But I'm going for all the extra stuff here. I mean, there's extra potions. I mean, there's 12. I think there's 12, 12 chests in the game. Is there eight chests? I can't bloody remember now. I think it might be eight. Two for each character. But the chests are very heavy. Best avoided. That's a third level. Hang on to that. So what is a Ven potion exactly? A poison cloud in a bottle, basically. Right. That's a sixth level, that one. So you want to hang on to that one for definite. Now, poison's great. Poison clouds are great, but the enemy will retreat if you cast one, whereas they don't retreat from poison, poison foe. So if you do want to use a poison, poison clouds are strong. But you want to freeze life so the enemy can't retreat or trap them under a door in a in a, in a corner. Okay, two two sword swings. They're dead. I know because your fighters now are getting to the point where they're so proficient. One whack. Well, that was a guy caught so there skeleton, isn't it? Yeah, I was expecting that to have uh, lasted a bit longer. Well, they're fairly weak enemies, but they got fairly good good defence because of the shield they're carrying. But they've only got falchions for weapons, so they don't hit particularly hard. But they've got fast attacks. They will whop away at you. But this so is, is that... the room I would have fallen into yeah. if I'd fallen through an hole. Yeah, I was going to say, that looks very much like the sea of holes above you. Yeah. Well, that's a spare strength potion. Give that to Elk. I never used to zip about the corridors as fast as you do either. I'd, I'd get lost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing is, if you think this game's bad, I mean, Blood Witch is ten times worse. You know, I mean, Captive had larger maps. I mean, this has got 32 by 32 Matrix. Uh, Captive was 32 by 64 Matrix. Grimrock was actually only 32 by 32. That disappointed the hell out of me, that did, because it's a PC game. You've got hundreds of meg at your disposal, but no. you chose to have maps that were only 32 by 32. No. No. Quickly fill your water up here, because no. you won't get another water fountain no. for a few more levels now. Lights have gone out again. Yeah, fill up the old water skins. No. That makes sense. No. Effectively stopped in the dark down a tunnel for a picnic. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, the uh, magic torch spells do last a while, but if you rest often, they will burn out quickly. I'm casting them at fifth level now. Right, it's Twinkle in a Woman's Eye, which is basically a uh, blue gem. Oh, Archie, now I have no back. Bow. Golden tail. Golden head and tail, but no body. Coin. And so I am all, I am none. I solved them all back in the day. Didn't need to look any of them up. If you get well, all four, it gives you a spare iron key. Uh, if you only get three of them, it will open the door, but not give you the spare key. So you want all four of them. Right, that's a beholder. They chuck poison. They chuck spells mm. at you, essentially, but they're nowhere near as devastating as they are in AD&D. You know, there's no petrification or instant death or any of that crap. <laughs> yeah, disintegration is a favourite one of the beholders in that. Yeah. Yeah, you said about you solved that without looking it up, but you think about it, in 1987, where would you have look, looked it up? There was no books on Dungeon Master in the library, no... Well, you had the tip there. sections, didn't you, in magazines? Yeah, but I mean, the tip section's hardly as uh, conclusive as typing something into Google. That's it. Well, that last room was a Grave of King Phileas, Keeper of Combinations. That's why I was clicking on them switches. And that one was the Grave of King Milius, uh, the Golden, who even in death thirsts for bullion. Give him two gold coins and it opens the door. Yeah, it opens the wall and you get the spare key. Basically, there's four keys. You want all four of them. I mean, one good smash and you can take the boulders down. This puzzle here, I actually solved around Jace for the first time. I wasn't sure how to do it. Because if you step into the teleporter, the door closes. But if you put an item into the teleporter, it teleports it to the touchpad and opens the gate. So you, you don't stand on the touchpad. You put an item on it. I fell down the hole on purpose there to get the first green magic box. Now, the green what? magic box is last 30 seconds. And what exactly do they do? They freeze life. Right. They work on everything except for low Chaos at the end of the game. He's pretty much immune to everything. Except for the fire stuff, but we'll get to that. But everything else in the game can be frozen. Think of it as a Time stop spell. But these things throw lightning poison. They can open doors. They're a real pain. But they're not particularly strong. They're more of a pain when there's lots of them. There's more skeletons. I've got to say, this is the furthest I've seen into this game since we were teenagers because, I mean, I haven't played it for years and... Um, even though we mentioned Lucosa's video, his was just a game reviewer. You know, it weren't a playthrough. So, um, yeah, seeing this far into the game, it, it's been a long while. And it's like, I, I'm, things are popping up. Oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> From you watching that you large, back then. You know, it's that large touchpad on the floor there. Yeah, A monster has to stand on that one in, in order to open that wall. You can't stand on it. Or you can't leave an item on it. I think you can stand on it, they can stand on it, but not an item. No matter how heavy it is, it has to be an enemy. The skeletons, oddly, run away uh, when you, you know, kill a few of them. That's kind of strange. I mean, I usually think of undead as just fighting until they're destroyed. You know, being mindless. But the skeletons, yeah. oddly, you can scare them away. Mind you, quite a few of the monsters in this back off if you start twatting them too much, don't they? Yeah, some enemies don't. Some enemies literally have no fear at all. But skeletons oddly do. <laughs> it seems <laughs> weird. Right, there's a breastplate, which is better than now. And there's a key. You know, some of the keys are hard to see on the floor. Yeah, yeah I remember that from playing it myself back in the day. Some of the first... Um, like iron keys and that are really hard to see. I mean, like the gold keys and that, they stand out really bright against the background. But yeah, um did take a while to get used to some of the way this game looks and the way it works and the mechanics of it. That's it. Well, that bit where I, I could have gone left or right at the junction there, if you go like, well, there's an the inscription on the wall that says like, if you want to stay alive, you better turn and run. If you go to the right, you know, I don't like to be ignored. If you go to the left, I hate. I don't. I hate cowards. 
but yeah it's beneficial to do both directions now this is another hidden section you notice I pressed a ring on the wall there it's actually a hidden switch it gives you your first Vorpal Blade right the Vorpal Blades they're not very good against standard standard monsters but they're very good against non-material creatures like ghosts no. so worth picking that up no. couple of spare drumsticks as well as well as a uh, a better helmet. I used to find when I was playing this, um, you know, when I was playing it properly, I'd get full up with so much stuff. None of my characters ever went hungry because I always had to eat something to pick something <laughs> up. <laughs> yeah. I've seen people on YouTube. I saw a guy playing Grimrock and he, he was carrying half the game's inventory around and he kept on dying because his characters were just moving too slowly. Right, this one is a uh, test your strength. Yeah, strength of your bow arm. Now, all right, you can like boost your strength up. Well, you can try to chuck an item with a strong character, but you generally need a lot of ninja levels to do that. And I can't be bothered with that, so we're cheating. Use the bow because the bow automatically shoots the shoots an arrow any distance. So yeah, test the strength of your bow arm. But that's not the proper way to do it. There's a couple of Slayer arrows there. To be honest, they're not much different from the normal arrows. They do a little more damage. They don't auto-slay a creature like in AD&D. &D, which is a bit of a disappointment again. The bows and the crossbows in this are very, very poor. So I generally don't bother with them. And it's the pain of picking the arrows off the floor. I mean, it wasn't until Curse of the Azure Bonds where you just used to buy 250 arrows, you know? <laughs> yeah. Don't have to worry about ammo then. Right, there's a bunch of wasps here, a lot of them, but they're very weak against poison, so just chuck the vent potion and just <laughs> die instantly. Bloody hell. I yeah, annihilate them. Yeah, they've literally got no resistance to poison at all. I mean, very strong against weapons, very weak against... There was a stamina potion I cast there by accident. But yeah, make up a bunch of uh, make up a bunch of healing potions. They'll come in handy later. Because the monsters are getting a bit tougher now. This leveling in the Grimrock mod was lethal. You got those uh, death metal looking beholders, didn't you? The ones that were the skulls with the tentacles coming out of them. Yeah. They were really, really difficult to kill, and they really did some damage. It was a nasty level in that Grimrock mod. It's not too bad in this. There's lots of shortcuts on this level. But I go the long way again, you know, just to fight all the additional enemies. Have you ever tried doing the 21-minute uh, speed run? I haven't actually. No. It's one of them things that can go wrong in so many places. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the guy that I actually, well, the playthrough that's on YouTube where he does it with Stam, at one point he went down to one health with Stam. That's how right. close he came to dying. So, yeah, he got through by the skin of his teeth. Uh, that was the PC version as well. Well, you could you could theoretically speed run any version, but the PC one's convenient because it counts the number of uh, steps. You know, in the uh, emulated version he used, which was quite handy. This is just a room full of boulders. Just blast all them. I think they're protecting a magic box. That one lasted a little bit longer. There was two of them there. <laughs> one died and the other one stepped straight in. And there's another one in there. There's four of them in this room. They're not particularly that much of a threat. They're more of a threat when there's a large group in together. Like when you get four on the same square. You get four lightning bolts in the face and it does hurt. Yeah, I can imagine it does. You don't get that many at this point. This is, well, I used to call it level five, but really it's level six now. Floor six. 
But the things you really want to get on this floor are the two Vorpal Blades because you're coming up on a very large open level we used to call the arena. And there's a lot of ghosts. So the Vorpal Blades will help. You get a couple of you staffs as well which fire uh, weakened non-material beings. So worth picking them up as well if you can find them. See, look, the wasp, you just can't hit the damn things. I think there's a water bottle in here. Slayer arrow, don't want that. Oh, there's the crossbow. Now, the crossbow was in the corner of that room, but you don't really need it. They just yeah. don't hit as hard as the melee weapons. This is all the stuff you you find out with, you know, years and hours upon hours of playing. Yeah, I mean, right. normally you think crossbow, yeah, excellent weapon. Yeah. I mean, in games like Icewind Dell, yeah, when you find a crossbow, that like a magic crossbow that shoots three bolts around, yeah, it's decent. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, in this, not so much. Probably wondering why I'm shooting poison at them. The Poison Foe spell actually does arrow damage. It does physical damage as well as poison damage. So, yeah, chuck it. Chuck it all in them. But that's a booby trap there. When you actually step near this grating, your instinct is to press that button. But as soon as you do, a wall opens behind you and four skeletons come out and you get <laughs> pincered between eight skeletons and they will rip your party to bits. So don't click that button until you've dealt with the enemies. As soon as you step in this room, another wall opens and you'll find yourself dealing with four lots of skeletons at once. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's rule number one. You know, deal with what you can see first. You know, don't start clicking buttons or pulling levers until you're sure what they do. But that rule applies to any dungeon crawler. You know, these skeletons have gone into like coward mode, so. Yeah, turn undead mode, isn't it? Yeah, oddly, you don't get that ability in this. I mean, you. Your priests, they can heal and they can, they can cast pacifying spells, but nothing along the line. And they cast shields as well, but nothing along the lines of turn undead. Well, I'd imagine when they was um, uh, was your second bubble blade. Yeah, when I was programming this game, I would imagine they were very, very conscious of not stepping on as it was at the time TSRs. Yeah. Toast with Dungeons and Dragons type names and that. I mean, yeah, all right, it'd be a lot. It'd be a lot worse now with who's got older Dungeons and Dragons these days. But um, even then, the thing I find really funny is D uh, W Bradley. He pretty much ripped off this game for Wiz Wizardry Six. Uh, Bane of the Cosmic Forge. Now I like Bane of the Cosmic Forge. I think it's a good game. It's it's a uh, turn-based combat you still walk around a dungeon like this but when you encounter enemies it's turn-based combat but he was very critical of Dungeon Master he didn't mention Dungeon Master by name but he did say oh I prefer turn-based combat like in you know, Dungeons and Dragons I don't like games where you swing a sword until the monster's dead but there are so many elements of Dungeon Master mm. in Wizardry 6 it's like you criticise it, but you copy it. That right. scroll there is fireball. Right. Fireball and longer lasting light and darkness. Uh, and fire shield. So this is the first time you get the fireball spell. So from now on, I can use fireball. Right? I fell down a pit deliberately there, which was a booby trap as soon as I walked down the stairs. But I did it on purpose, because you end up in a location with some extra bottles and another you stuff. And it also teleports you close to a trap that you want to disable. Otherwise, you're going to have to walk there manually and it, so you're going to get fireballed on the way. But if you fall down this second pit here, around the corner, deliberately fall down there, get your second use stuff, which have got weakened non-material beings on them. Just in case you can't cast. Well, you don't really want to waste you, your spells on I mean, your mana are mundane spells at this point. You want to use your staffs and keep these spells for 
Well, I suppose you can't cast using the rods. I switch to the vocal place because now, right, you'd step into this teleporter here and it teleports you straight near the trap you need to disable rather than walking all the way around the room to get to it. Yeah, annoying little gigglers. They steal your items off you. They don't attack you, but they do steal your items off you. Any item that's in your hand. Right, click that button, opens that wall. I'm actually waiting until the fireball cannon fires, but I forget it, just run in, grab the chest. <laughs> but fireballs come down there and then they bounce around the room between all those teleporters. But by falling down that hole, you literally appear right near the trap. You can turn it off straight away. You know, so I used a fireball there. But yeah, chop the ghost with one hit from the vocal blade. Very handy indeed. Otherwise, you'd have to use spells. And it, well, if you didn't find the uh, use stuffs, you'd have to kill them manually. And there's a lot of them in this room. Because this is a huge open level. That's why we called it the arena. Buttons all over the place. Lots of items to pick up. It's another rabbit's foot. Then that's a fall bomb. Which is basically a fireball in a bowl. You cannot make fall bombs. But you can make Ven potions. So save saved the, saved the fall bombs. Right, I'm back where I fell down that pit. Certainly made short work of the ghost. Yeah, there's monsters all over the place here. But you notice that I can only just about cast a fourth level fireball, even with all the skill I've amassed. So I think by this point, I'm practically an artisan wizard, so. Yeah, just fan bomb them, uh, full bomb them. Right, that scroll there is four potions for boosting skills. Basically, it, you can have added strength, dexterity, wisdom, and vitality. Nope. I don't bother with them at this point because you need a lot of skill to cast them. But the strength one especially will come in handy later. I mean, obviously, you still know the spell even if you didn't find that. But that's where it is in the game. Yeah, you can chop them ghosts down easily with a Vorpal Blade. The Vorpal Blade is the only weapon in the game that will hit any type of monster. Right, this is another hidden location. This corridor here has got a teleporter down it. If you hit the teleporter, it teleports you back down the corridor. But if you walk to one square before that teleporter teleports you, just where that chaos face is, and wait, the wall opens. And you get a ton of mummies. And these are really strong mummies. A fireball, these. Mummies are fairly weak against fire, same as in AD&D. &D. Fairly strong skeleton. He didn't look that strong with what you just did to him. Again. <laughs> well, we've got fairly good characters at this point now. I think they're probably artisan fighters by this point. Right, that's the Delta, Mixy Load, as I call it. <laughs> <laughs> it's called the Dower. Yeah, basically that's a, a very strong sword. Well, you can see by how thick it is, can't you? That's got chop, melee and thrust on it, I think. So very, very powerful sword. It's, it's a hidden weapon, so gives you mana and it's got very high to hit. I also found a jeweled symbol in another magic box as well. Jeweled symbol gives you anti-magic which protects you from poison and all kinds of other spells. Don't protect you from fire, though. Well, there's an annoying giggler. Just kill him. <laughs> They're annoying now. In the ST version, they would only take your items out of your left hand. But in this, they take your items out of any hand. In Skull Keep, they'll take the items off your back. Literally take the clothes off your back. They did in... a. Uh, DM Java as well. They were really annoying. It was best to just freeze life and batter them. Because they start stealing your clothes and it's just a pain putting your items back on. Yeah. Now, I didn't pick up the mace of all. Now, the mace, just like the mace on her level, uh, the poison level earlier, the maces are not very good in this. 
unlike AD and D where they're good against skeletons or any type of skeletal undead, they're very poor in this. Even though the Mace of Order does give you additional strength, I think it gives you five strength. But I stick with the swords, swords and the axes. They are just better weapons. That's the Staff of Mana, which gives you more mana than any other staff in the game. It's got Fire Shield on it as well, which is very useful later on. Mm -hmm. I already picked up the Toe Wand on the uh, Worm level, which also gives you Fire Shields. You will need them later. I mean, if I hadn't have fallen down the hole on this this level, I could have used Fire Shields to protect me from the Fireballs flying around the room. The ST version, the Fireballs did a lot of damage on this room. The Omega version, they toned it right down. Yeah, just bomb them. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah, make use of the items they give you. You know, don't hoard your stuff. There's no point. I mean, the amount of times I see people doing that, just holding tons. Oh, I'll use this item. I've got to use this item. It's like, and then suddenly it's game over. And it's like, and you didn't use any of that stuff. People used to do it in Golden Axe. They used to store the magic, didn't they? Despite the game gives you about five dragons worth of potions. You know, just use the magic. <laughs> right. This is probably my favourite level in the entire game. Okay. Right. When is Rock Not Rock? Basically, the first time I ever encountered an illusionary wall. Uh, this was when I was uh, in digs at Flows. I was kind of stuck on this level because it seemed like it was small. There was nowhere to go. And then I was just mucking about, chucking items around, and an item went through the wall. And I thought, when is rock not rock? Uh, when it's an illusion. Well, you get little vexerks here. That were uh, look like jowers, don't they? I do, yeah. They're small sorcerers, essentially. They cast... cast I think they were called vexerks in Chaos Strikes Back, and they had grey cloaks. In this, I think they just called them small sorcerers. But yeah, they fire fireballs and lightning and poison and all that. Yeah, so you don't really want that. Uh, that gives you wizard levels, which you definitely want. Yeah, you can pretty much cast six level spells now. Nice. Yeah, he's an adept wizard. You only need to be an expert wizard, and that's it. You can cast everything at sixth level. I mean, some spells are harder to cast than others. Fireballs, you really do need to be practically a master wizard to do a sick level fireball to get any real power out of it. Right, there's a spinner there, which is designed to have you walking around the level completely lost. Right, and now we get my favourite monster in the whole game. <laughs> Giant rat. Right, these cannot be scared off. And they are very, very... They do incredible damage. They cause injuries. And they're very strong against all spells but poison. And you can get double sets of them, which will rip your party to bits. So you don't want to mess with the rats. Take them down quick. Right, that's a rust monster. Originally, they were going to rust your weapons and armor, but the code was never implemented. I'm kind of glad about that. <laughs> I hate them in AD&D. Yeah, that might be why they code wasn't implemented <laughs> yeah but yeah the, the giant rats uh, Andy Jaros' best monster as far as I'm concerned they took him out of Chaos Strikes back they replaced him with Hellhounds which I just didn't think looked as good what was that ring you just picked up a uh, storm ring fires lightning bolts uh, you oh, only nice. get a limited supply of them though lightning's okay it's a bit better against metallic enemies. It's not particularly good against living enemies, though. Unlike AD and D, where lightning goes straight through things, doesn't it? Oh, wrong side of the corridor. Yeah, you don't really want them s chucking spells into me. They're fairly slow moving now. They drop a bunch of food when they die. Was that a key one of them dropped as well? No. Uh, just items. Right. right, that chest, there's two ways of doing the two ways of doing this. You can just keep throwing items until it goes through the grating, but the percentage chance is very low. The proper way to do it, as it says when you open this chest up on the scroll, put the gem back. 
In other words, where that chest was, put the gem where the chest was, and it will open the grating. Now, you can try to chuck the gem through the grating, as I said, to open it, but there's a risk it will go too far and land in the hole behind. So the best thing to do is go upstairs, round this way. I think you'll run into another rust monster here. Well, no, I guess not. But that hole there is basically where that grating is. So I'll just chuck it there. You can't fall through the hole as well if you want. Lands on the other side of the grating, but yeah, we'll do it properly. Swap the ring round, on it? <laughs> Grimrock won't let you do that. Grimrock grazed the hand out so you can't pick the item up. But yeah, Dungeon Master, you can exploit the crap out of it. Swap the item between your character's hands, isn't it? So, so they that, can all have a shot with it. So that ring's totally expended now, which is why you dumped yeah. it, yeah? Right. Yeah, you can't recharge items. In uh, Skull Keep, you could. You could take it back to the shop and you get it recharged. I mean, AD and D, you could recharge things if you're a wizard. You couldn't in the uh, games, though. I don't think the games ever let you recharge items. You had to go to the shop to do that. And you had to have at least one charge left in it. If you used all the charges, the item disappeared. Yeah, what's uh, under underfoot is soon overhead. You see the little touchpads on the floor? Yeah. Basically, they launch fireballs at you. So put items on the touchpads. Any old rubbish should do. And then just retreat out of range. Now you can walk across safely. You can use a fire shield, though, and take it to the face, as it were. Take it to the chin. But why bother when you can wait the touchpads? But yeah, you got rust monsters in Eye of the Beholder. Yeah, and they would they would destroy your fancy plus five sword. <laughs> yeah, they were nasty little things. Stay away from them, magic missile. Them. Bloody annoying. I mean, they're not dangerous enemies, but yeah, they wreck your weapons. Have a skeleton key there for the shortcut. Because there's a, there's two sets of stairs that run literally from uh, the Tomb of the Fire Staff, which was just before the arena, and the very very bottom deck where Chaos is. And you need the skeleton keys to unlock that section. But they're hidden all over the place on every level. Uh, there's the rope there. I don't bother with it, though. I thought there was an extra rat here, but it turns out there isn't. There's just more rust monsters. Uh, in the Grimrock mod, I was really disappointed with the Grimrock mod. No one did a rat rat uh, model, did they? You know, you basically got those blue lizards instead and mushroom monsters. I'm ah, oh. <laughs> could have at least done a rat model. I ran the corner here. There's the rat cage. There's a touch pad just before the door that makes rats generate. And if you keep walking backwards and forwards on it, this entire cage fills up with rats. And I used to do it on purpose. I you know, just to get tons of drumsticks. Yeah, as you'd notice, the rats drop drumsticks. You do sometimes get double sets of rats there, but I've only got a single. Hello. And the rats look like giant mice in Nexus. I kid you not. And they squeaked as well. <laughs> when they died, it was actually kind of pathetic the way it kind of falls sideways. And it was like, oh my God, I just killed a giant mouse. <laughs> and they, they don't even look scary at all. I mean, in this, you know, when they roar at you, and you're like, when you first walk into one, it's like, oh crap, <laughs> what's that? Well, at least they do look fierce in this. Yeah, they do. I know the monster manual that I used to have didn't have a giant rat listed as a specific enemy. They used to have giant rats as in, you know, one that's about a foot long or two foot long, but no really big rats. Right, for water fountain. We're only down, just click on the fountain and have everybody drink. Don't have to bother with our skins then. Right, that's the first uh, skull lock. Right, we can do longer lasting light now, which lasts much longer than a torch. That spell was actually taken out of uh, DM Java, and it wasn't in a uh, Nexus either. 
Not sure why they took that spell axe. It's incredibly useful. Just means you don't have to bother with torches at all. Or worry about the light going down. Perhaps they were trying to up the difficulty or something. That's why they normally take these things out. Yeah. Right, we're back to skeletons now. Right, this one is uh, beware my twisted humour to deceive the snake. There's lots of teleporters in here. Just basically S snake your way round the platform, round these columns, avoiding the hidden teleporters. Get the two bar holders. Right, choose a door. You can open either one. Just get different monsters behind each one. I think this one's got skeletons and one of the nastier enemies in the game. Skeletons aren't too bad. There's four of them. But yeah, just blow them away. Oh, missed that up. <laughs> right, that's a scorpion. They do poison you quite strongly and they do hit hard. This one's a baby one, though. Not a very strong one, this one. And he don't seem interested in attacking, either. He missed, and he's dead. That one's fairly weak. But they can hit incredibly hard. If they hit one of your unarmoured characters, they can do a couple of hundred damage. Bloody hell. I mean, it does look quite menacing. There's a, a really good graphic of a scorpion as well. Yeah, Andy Jaros was certainly a good artist. You notice how I went back and opened the other door. You don't have to. This one's probably a little bit easier because you only get a giggler in here and some beholders. Only thing about that giggler is it looks like a sodding Pokemon. <laughs> he literally looks like an apple with legs in uh, Skull Keep, and you only get one in the entire game. I mean, they replaced him pretty much with this annoying little dwarf character who just keeps stealing his stuff off you. Yeah, just poison these beholders. These ones are quite tough. Oh, lightning bolted me. He drops a key. And this is level 8 now, or 9 if you're counting it, from uh, the Hall of Champions. What's the official shout on that for the levels? Is it 8 or is it 9? Well, I mean, really, it'd be 9 because the Hall of Champions is technically level 1. But we always used to call level 1 the level after the Hall of Champions because all the champions, there are no enemies, no no puzzles to solve. Technically, the game's got 14 <laughs> levels. In the Hall of Champions at one and you know fourteen uh, being the deepest one. I won't say any more about that at the moment because there's a certain enemy on it. See, that's the other door you would have come out with if I'd gone the other way. Yeah. Right, this is the zoom puzzle coming up now. As soon as you step on these touch pads. You zoom around the room on <laughs> like crazy. I telefragged those boulders there. Basically, you can't have two enemies on the same square. So if you go down the stairs and the enemies on that square, they will just die instantly. That teleport takes you back to the beginning. So don't step into that. But yeah, past that bit. To be fair, that weren't much, like, weren't much faster than you on the controls anyway. Let's be honest. Well, that zoom puzzle is not as bad as the one in... The one in Carl Strikes Back is ten times worse. I tried to avoid that particular area of the game until a very late game. Right, that's the speed bow. Which just does more damage. It doesn't actually shoot faster. In the Grimrock mod, it shot twice as fast, so it was a really good weapon. You could effectively fire four shots, four shots compared to firing one shot with a bow. Which did make it incredibly strong. Right, we're in the menagerie here, which is a bunch of monsters, which are all held in a, held in teleport fields. If you click the button, the cross-shaped button at the beginning, like an idiot, it releases all the enemies and they all flood into the room and attack you simultaneously. 
So don't touch the button and fight them one on one. You can just simply run around them as well. But you might as well get the extra experience. It's random which monsters appear as well. You'll get a mixture of skeletons, beholders, gigglers, and sometimes a scorpion. You don't get a couple of gigglers, eh? Got a few bits to pick up again now. Yeah, they've stolen all my bloody crap off me. <laughs> this next section now is incredibly confusing. I know when I first played it, I got turned around so badly on this next bit. All the doors have been deliberately left open, so the monsters are free to roam around. And it's very easy to get disorientated, because it all looks the same. I mean, I know the level off by art now, but at the time I didn't. There's another scorpion. I think that's another weak scorpion. Yeah, that one's fairly weak. Hello. More giggly. They're all over the place on this level. Bloody oh, annoying, they, they are. Yeah, that gives you a moonstone. Just in case you didn't pick Chani. That just gives you a little bit of extra mana. I oh, don't bother with that. Better off to have the wizard and priest levels. Right, we've got full plate now. It's very heavy, understandably. <laughs> yeah. Even with his with his massive strength, he can barely, barely manage it. You don't want your characters overloaded. It slows you down incredibly. Yeah, they um, kind of underplay um, the weight of plate armor in Hollywood, don't they? In, in, in films and that, you know, people getting up on and off horses and running about, and it's like, well, yeah. no, I don't think so. Yeah, I know Robbie Lapthorne, he said he used to do reenactment, and he said, like, chainmail, God, it, he really fell it on your shoulders. He said plate mail. He said plate wasn't as bad because the thing about plate, it's strapped to your arms and now, isn't it? Yeah. You know, whereas chain mail, it's all resting on your shoulders. But he says, yeah, you're still not going to be running around like you're wearing your birthday suit. You know, it is heavy, and you, it doesn't protect you as well as you think. He said when someone clonks you with a mace, you know, it may not cut you, you know, but you will bruise. That's why they wore so much padding under it. Right, first pair of boats of speed. Right, boats of speed do exactly what they say. They allow you to move twice as fast, but only if you've got all four pairs. If you're playing a single character, though, by this point, yeah, you move like lightning. That's how you speed run it. Boats of speed also ignore your current weight. So if you're overloaded, you move as if you're not overloaded. Well, that's pretty useful. Would that not be an idea to give them to someone that's got full plate apart from his boots? Obviously yeah, not, because you I haven't do done do it. Yeah, I do that later on, obviously, oh, right. because you need the speed. I mean, the faster you can move. I mean, it's the same with all games, isn't it? I mean, the gold box games, once you've got boots of speed on your characters, you can run circles around the monsters because you can close close with them before they can even get an attack off. Yeah, this is really, really fucking taking me back to um, being sat in my bedroom at my mum's house with me, like, sat on my bed, and you sat at the computer desk just watching you play this for hours, man. <laughs> it's a proper nostalgic trip, this is. It's been so long. I think this was about as far as Jay got. I remember being around his house one time, and he got himself trapped by a scorpion, and he couldn't get out of it, you know, because the scorpions really do take a, a bashing. Because there's a couple of really strong ones coming up. And if you get caught by one of them, which he did, right? It's a shield of light, which is essentially a lighter shield with uh, better stats. Does it give off light? It doesn't. It's, well, it's spelled L-Y-T-E. Oh, right. 
I think it's called platinum armor in a Nexus, but it serves the same purpose. It's just lightweight armor that still provides the same benefits. But yeah, this one here is damn strong, as you can see. Look, <laughs> the pounding that's taking all them poison spells. Well, I've got that one. I think there's one more skulking around in here. I mean, they're fairly weak against poison. They're very strong against fire. Right, there was a hidden switch there, which gives you the first of the berserking weapons, which is basically hard cleave. Best axe in the game. You need a lot of experience to use it, though. You need to be an expert fire. I mean, berserk is the strongest move you can do. You know, just like in AD&D and every other adventure type game berserk is usually a devastating attack for a fire it certainly was in the Diablo games I mean I never used to play the barb I used to play like the uh, sorceress but I think when we moved down here I just thought I'd give the barb a go you know and it, it is just ridiculous how over the top powerful he is <laughs> yeah you can literally run around the battlefield just murdering things you know using berserk you know, I'm frenzy. Yeah, there's another one of these damn things here. You notice at the moment I've only got cleave, which is the second strongest attack. Cleave's got very poor accuracy. I mean, Berserk's got pretty poor accuracy as well, but when it hits, it can do hundreds of damage. That's a lot of beholders. Imagine facing off against three beholders in Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> oh, you mean like in Baldur's Gate 2? <laughs> yeah. yeah, Baldur's Gate 2. My God, they couldn't have packed in anymore. There's, there's literally one whole mission called the uh, Unseeing Eye, I think it is. And you get a lot, don't you? You get the little, you get the little gosh ones, you know, the baby beholders, and you get the elder, elder orbs. You know, the ones that are really, really dangerous. Cool. But they do give you the shield of border end, which is uh, made of an eye, made of a beholder's eye stalk or something, or its central eye, and it makes you immune to beholder, beholder gaze and beholder uh, eye stalk attacks. No. Only for one character, though. Yeah, that was a right nasty ass mission, that was. <laughs> right, we've done that level anyway. Right, we're on to uh, the turn back puzzle and clockwise. Again, it's a room where you've got four four loops and you teleport between those loops by walking round a certain way to hit the hidden touch pads. As you notice, I'm walking backwards. Yeah. If you walk forwards, it don't hit the touch pads and you don't get to where you were going. Oddly, that takes an iron key, not a gold key. I wonder if they used the wrong graphics there. Well, yeah. I mean, like, they might have done, or it might have just been a one of them, one of them things these bastard programmers put in to confuse the player. Probably. Can you imagine if if you're playing this game, and you, this is as far as you get, and you get stuck because you haven't got a gold key, and you think, "Oh bollocks!" So you spend all that time playing again, keeping a gold key, and you get there, and it don't work. That's exactly what these programmers do. Yeah, I mean, if you kept a gold key from earlier, you know, it won't do you any good at all because it don't take that key. But yeah, uh, when you put the key in that lock there, it floods that particular section with wasps. I mean, there's gigglers wandering around as well, more wasps. You know, they're not much of a threat. As long as you don't get surrounded. Yeah, you don't want the rear characters poisoned because they've got a lot lower health than the front characters. Right, this puzzle, don't bother opening the door, just smash it in. Because otherwise you'll get caught by this trap. Right, there's a sword here that looks like it's protected by a rather ominous trap. You know, unlike Grimrock, you can't swap the items round. <laughs> you have to take the sword and run. 
Yeah, well, you can't just take the sword and rest and hope the poison don't kill you. But yeah, make sure your characters are at full health. Grab the sword and leg it. If you put the sword on the floor, uh, it don't trip the traps further down the corridor. It only trips the... Uh, well, the, the poison, if you're carrying the sword. Nope. So if you chuck the sword nope. down the corridor over the touch pads, it don't trip them, which is what I'll do. And now the traps don't go off. Only the first one, when you picked it up. In Nexus, you could switch the items round, as in you could put a useless item and then pick the sword up. Uh, you could do the same thing in Grimrock as well. You could literally switch the items round. If you didn't, you got lightning bolted to death. Well, that's the Fury Sword. Yeah, that was the Diamond Edge I picked up. Right, eh? Which has got <clears throat> very high to hit. It's also a ninja weapon, surprisingly, not a fire weapon. Uh, the Fury shoots, shoots fireballs, limited supply. That's a spare key. I didn't discover that key until quite late, late in the day. Yeah, it must have been a year after I bought the game. Yeah, you know, I actually just accidentally stumbled on that key. There was kind of an ominous click when I walked out of the alcove. I thought, what clicked? And you go back in the alcove and the wall's disappeared. There's a key behind it after you click the extra button. Yeah, there's some more wasps in here. Yeah, that one injured him as well. He even threw that mithril mail there. The mithril mail is as good as plate and a lot yeah. lighter. But you don't get very much of it. I think you get a couple of uh, suits of it in. You get a couple of suits of it in a uh, Cal Strikes Back. Well, it's been yeah, a while since we've seen it. them, hasn't it? <laughs> I haven't seen them for quite yeah. some time. I'm pretty sure I got a bit disorientated here. I wasn't sure if like the giggler had stolen an item off me. And I was looking around on the floor here trying to find it. Because it looks like I've lost a bowl. But I couldn't find it. There's a good reason for that, as you'll see in a minute. And I'm wandering around looking for the looking for the item. Eventually I just ended up putting a bottle in his hand. <laughs> uh, there's a good reason why that bottle wasn't on the floor. Okay. Yeah, stab's very effective, yeah. Well, there's a few of them coming along there, isn't there? Yeah, just stab them to death. It's a very effective ninja weapon. <laughs> you ain't running. But yeah, there. that's why the bottle wasn't on the floor. Because the giggler oh, cause... didn't die, he dodged the fireball. <laughs> yeah. So essentially, pick your items back up and move on. Yeah, that's why the bottle wasn't on the floor. Because I didn't, I didn't notice that the giggler had escaped. But yeah, just blow these away. Well, that's an effective fireball, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, at this point, you can cast fourth levels quite easily. I think they're pretty much adept, adept ex, def, he might be an expert wizard by this point. Yeah, the Fury's not a bad sword in its own right, but I think it's only got chop and chop and swing on it, or chop and melee. But it does shoot, I think it's got about 12 fireball charges on it, which is quite, quite handy. Well, it's a hidden location here. You get all the armour alight. Which is slightly better than Mithril. So I dumped the uh, heavy plate. Oh, water elemental. 
as you can imagine, they can only be hit by the Vorpal Blades and spells. So, what them with them? The water elementals can hit any party member. They do hit quite hard as well. But they're not particularly strong. They'll go down with about four spells. It's not cause an injury. The injuries essentially affect that body part. It will reduce your carrying capacity and it will affect your fighting ability if it's your arms, yeah. arms, hands, and it will affect your speed if it's your legs, feet. If it's your head, it will affect your spell casting. Again, it's more um, more depth to the game, you know, with, with uh, different parts being hit and stuff like that. Right, that magnifier I picked up earlier, right, enlarge my drumstick. You're supposed to use the magnifier, but I, you can use anything for some strange reason. Probably a bug, but yeah, I always use a drumstick. <laughs> Just for the hell of it, isn't it? I'm pretty sure it's got the same bug in Cow Strikes Back as well. As in, you're not supposed to be able to just use a drumstick, but you can. Well, this is kind of a the shop area that takes all those coins I kept. You know, so open all these up. You can get two coins on that one, so get lots of magic boxes and Venn bombs. and It's the magic boxes you definitely want, though. That's a chest full of food, just in case you ain't got any. But we've been storing all the magic boxes for a reason. Because up to this point, you only really needed the blue magic boxes to finish the enemies off quickly. But the enemies are getting stronger now. So the blue magic boxes won't cut it anymore. All right, that's the stairs down. But before I do that, they gave me a spare cross key there. So where it said choose a door, where there was three paths, you can go back and choose another path. You can never open all three, but you can open two out of three if you want the extra items. I mean, basically, I chose probably the second hardest one there. I mean, the middle one's got water elementals and gigglers. The left one, as you saw, had a... No, the right one had the trollins, and they do all regenerate as well. Had the trollins and the gigglers. And the other side has got wasps. It's by far the most dangerous one. You get wasps in groups of four, and if you get surrounded, they will kill you quickly. In the Grimrock mod, they're lethal, the wasps are, because they were those giant bug creatures, the ones that looked like they were flying, flying head lice. Yeah, they looked really creepy, they did, didn't they, in Grimrock? Yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah, they looked like flying head lice. Yeah, with the big mandibles, it just looked, it just looked really horrible. It weren't one of my favourite enemies. I think sometimes too much detail in a game can be a bad thing. It looks like some kind of Cthulhu horror. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, all right. It's not anime, is it? I mean, if this were a Toho game, they'd probably have cute fairies attacking you. Uh, spell circles and all that kind of stuff. Oh, got a ninja level out of that. But yeah, the, uh, it's the only uh, ninja sword in the game, the Diamond Edge. It's a pity you didn't have any katanas or... I think uh, Iaido, the Japanese character in the All of Champions, he starts with a samurai sword, which is an okay weapon. You'd think it would be a lot better, but it isn't. Uh, in Grimrock, it was an excellent weapon. You know, the Bushido blade. But not in this. I mean, Crowther did actually put uh, ninja weapons in, or samurai weapons in, Nightmare, but for some reason, they're only in the code. They're not in the game itself. They got taken out. Well, that's odd. I'm not sure why. Again, it might have just been a last-minute decision, or maybe you just forgot. I mean, there's plenty of things in Captive that were meant to be implemented, but didn't that? I mean, you were going to have mixed encounters, for one thing. You know, where you've got two types of enemy on the same square. I mean, you know how quickly to... that kills the wasps, yeah. Yeah, you still managed to grab your shield, though, that little git. Oh, no. <laughs> they pain, aren't they? Yeah, you get three of them in here. Then you get a ton of wasps. 
But it's almost, you, know, you do get a drumstick though. It's almost a waste of time swinging your weapons at the wasps. They've pretty much got 100% evasion. I mean, you can hit them. But they're certainly not like the wasps in a Isle of Holder 2. They poisoned and they paralysed, but they were fairly easy to hit. They weren't particularly strong either. You know, one could swing from your plus five sword, but generally knock them down. I mean, by that point, you're generally a 10th level fighter anyway. I mean, it was just the sheer number of them. That was, that was really the problem. They were all over the uh, Azure Tower, I think it was, or the Silver Tower. It's been a while since I played EOB 2. How do you rate the Ida B older games against this? I think I've I think I've said before, ain't I, that I, my number one slot would be Dungeon Master and Captive Joint. But EOB two would definitely be second. It's just such a damn good game. Yeah, it's got a great storyline. Got a great protagonist, great antagonist. You know, it is it is a damn good game. Everything they did with Eob, they improved in the second game. No end. Pity they didn't follow through with the second one. No, in the third game. Yeah, these nasty little insubstantial triffids, or I think they're called uh, phasers or faders, something like that. They phase out and you can't hit them with spells. Uh, well, you can't hit them with spells, but you can still hit them with a Vorpal Blades, even when they're phased out. So again, very, very good idea to hang on to them swords. Yeah, definitely. Uh, they shoot very strong fireballs at you, if you're unlucky. So don't let them. Uh, that's a snake staff, which has got unlimited hill spells on it. Uh, this is the first floor where you actually get invisible holes. You notice where I trod on that touchpad, I trod back on it. So it shut the hole. Right now you start getting really tough enemies. Basically knights. These not only get lots of attacks, they are very difficult to hit. The diamond edge has got the best chance of hitting him. And if you've got berserk, which I currently haven't, because I ain't got the skill to do it. So just go with the diamond edge. Spells are a complete waste of time. They do so little damage. And contrary to what they kept saying in the magazines, poison does no damage to these enemies. I don't know why they kept propagating that myth, you know, in the magazines, that you can't poison clouds kill them. No, they don't. It's a, it's a flipping automaton. You know, it's a suit of armour. It's not a person. <laughs> no, it's an automaton. I think the only spell that really affects it is lightning. But lightning takes a hell of a lot of mana to cast, and it doesn't do a lot of damage. If I remember the stats, I think it's got about 80% magic resistance. All its items are cursed as well, so don't use them. Oh, well, I was going to say, can you pick any of its stuff up? Uh, yeah, uh, there, put, there's the answer. The yeah, if you pick up the cursed items, uh, it will nope. make you much easier to hit, nope. and your weapons just miss constantly. Nope. No. It's taste... possible to wrap the luck round, though. If you actually put all four rabbits' feet on one character and then pick up all the cursed armour, it wraps the luck round to 255, and you can never be hit ever again by physical attacks. Magic still hurts, but the enemies can't hit you. I don't do that in this playthrough. <laughs> Where did you find that out? <laughs> I'm pretty sure I did read that in uh, one of the magazines. I mean, the magazines weren't always wrong. But they are wrong about that. You know, poison has no effect on these enemies. Only lightning and fire. But fire is practically useless. It's just not worth it. You know, just, just hit them with your diamond edge. You can also drop them down the hole as well. Now, if you walk back into the middle of this big room here and wait until you see the knight one square away from where that touchpad is, step on it quickly, the knight falls through and dies instantly. That's a good, uh, In the speed run, you see, see, can you see the dotted hole? Yep. You could just see it. But yeah, he fell through the arm and died. Yeah, anything falling through, 
Some enemies will survive, but the knights don't. Now they do in Chaos Strikes Back. You had to drop them two floors. Reminded me of Space Panic, actually. We had to drop the enemies more than one floor. Well, that's a black flame. Which, again, can be hit by your Vorpal Blaze or by a non-material. Uh, fire shields will make you totally immune to their attacks. It looks like something out of Stranger Things, that does. I'll shut those pits again. But, I mean, the knights are carrying the keys, so you do need to kill them. Or at least one of them, anyway. The other one was just guarding a key. Right, this is your second raw key. So you've now got enough keys to get into the term of fire staff because you need three. You had one on the second level, one on the rat level, and one on this level. So you got the three keys now, All and right. you got the. Uh, I think you got the ruby key. I got that on the previous level with the uh, magnifier. So you need one more key now to get to the fire staff. Which you need to defeat Chaos. And Chaos is the big bad, isn't he? Yeah, if you've read the story, which was written by uh, Wayne Holder's wife, I think, Nancy Holder. I mean, most people, I've heard people on YouTube say, oh, the game's got no story to speak of. You know, I think someone said that to me uh, in a comment on, I can't remember if it was on Nightmare or Captive. Oh, these games didn't have a story, and I said I'm sure I'm sure Nancy Holder would disagree with you. I mean, it was quite a good story, you know, about how the Grey Lord basically got torn asunder and turned into Lord Lord Order and Lord Chaos, or Lord Lord Librisulus and Lord Chaos. Yeah, you know, and basically Theron is sent into. Well, Theron basically ends up uh, non corporeal and. He's controlling the champions. He's forced to watch all the champions foul the first time. That's why they're all in those mirrors, because that's what that's where chaos put them. You know, it's kind of a warning. You basically have to choose your four, isn't it? Yeah. Like I said, on the PC Engine version, which was called Theron's Quest, you actually play Theron. He's one of your characters. He's the only character that transfers between the missions. All the other characters don't. Yeah, this is nasty, this bit, because you get four of them. You do not want four fireballs in the face. And the thing is, while they're phased out, you can't hit them with uh, those spells. Like, they don't do any damage. So you just have to whack away at them with your vorpal blades. But the green magic boxes do last a bit of time, so it gives you 30 seconds to take them down. That's why the vorpal blades are so, so useful. Because you can pretty much skip out the skeleton level, but it is worth exploring to get those two swords because they come in so such hand. Or well, they come in so handy. Well, you've proved the point just just there by itself. I mean, getting four fireballs at once. I mean, you've got a yeah. strong part. I mean, yeah, even with the two fire shields I've put up, they still will sting. Right, there's a bunch of items here, but I want to get the. Uh, well, I want to get the other faders first. They're hanging around this area. Me and Dean actually completed this game and never found this section. Right, basically this section here is optional. When I first played it, well, when me and Dean first completed it, we never found this section. In fact, I remember seeing Dean in like WH Smith. It must have been three weeks later or something. I said I was still playing it and I'd found like another section. He was quite <laughs> surprised at that actually because he'd moved on by that point. But yeah, this section here is where all the armor of dark is. But there's a couple of knights here. But yeah, so what? Trap them under a door, just mash them to death with a magic box. Yeah, it just used it. I mean, nothing is immune to doors in this game because the doors are obviously massive but you get the armor well you get the all the armor of dark in this location you get the helm in here and the shield and the leg plate and the foot plate around the other side i think you get like six level full bomb i'm just coming to terms with the fact that you basically you've basically said the best weapon in the game is a door <laughs> Yeah, I suppose it is. If you can 
trap it's something under it and freeze life you know it's pretty much screwed it can't back away it's probably why they didn't put it implement that in grimrock you know the doors will not hit the enemies well, there's, there's, there's those two faders i missed before well they're both dead bloody hell you really made mincemeat out of them yeah i got lucky with the uh, weaken non-material beings there or dispel magic I mean, if you hit them as they fade in, they will both die. But go back round the side here. I would have done this earlier, but you can't really risk picking these items up when those faders are wandering around because if they trap you, yeah, they will fireball you to death pretty quickly. Right, that's plate of foots of dark, as I call it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically they're grieving it and the pollen. And obviously the plate. The plate's very heavy, but it practically makes your character invisible. I mean, you can still be hit, but less likely. It's very heavy. No. I mean, Hiss has actually got a ridiculous no. carrying capacity there because there's actually a buck in the, the Omega version. When your stamina drops below half, your carrying capacity is supposed to go down. In the Omega version, it goes up instead. Someone must have put an integer in in the program <laughs> wrong <laughs> yeah it's actually a bug as you can see it's way too heavy so give him the boost of speed in fact give them both the boost of speed <laughs> give them the plate because at this point it don't matter because everyone's going to end up with boost of speed if you can find them all I mean yeah, one yeah. of them's actually on the terminal fire stuff and the other three are hidden Naturally, you know where they all are. Yeah. Well, one set you can't you can't avoid. There's another knight hiding around here. Again, this location I didn't find originally. He actually managed to hit me through that armor there. But yeah, one set you can't really avoid because you have to go into that location in order to reach the end of the level. I suppose it's possible you'd miss that section entirely. They take a beat in them knights, don't they? Yeah, they do, but they're not the strongest enemy in the game. Bunch of potions here, and also the invisibility scroll. Which is not as useful as you think. It doesn't last very long, and it will not allow you to run around the enemies. So if an enemy's in the way, it can't see you, but you still can't get past it. So not much use in a speed run. And you can't backstab in this guy. Which is a bit of a shame. Obviously you could in Grimrock. Oh, you could in uh, Blood Witch as well. In fact, Blood Witch backstabbing was devastating. I know having watched you play a load of these uh, type of games, you know, dungeon crawlers, you're quite a fan of running around the enemies and stabbing them in the sides and that when they're not facing you, aren't they? Is that apply to this game as well? You can attack the enemy on their flanks, but to be honest, you need that all-important experience, so you really have to tow it out with them most of the time. It's a really weak, really weak uh, Oitu, that is. I know they look like spiders, but they are called Oitu. They haven't, they haven't even got eight legs, have they? <laughs> So what are those potions you've made there with the swords on? Strength. Strength, right, okay. Temporary boast, essentially. Probably one of the most potent, potent spells in the game. They take a lot of skill to cast, but if you can boost your strength up to over 100, your fighters will hit very hard. No. I mean, it's only temporary, so you don't really want to be resting no. after you've used them. Because just like uh, AD&D, you know, giant strength potions don't last forever. No. No. Well, they did in Ida Boulder too, if you uh, used them at the end of Ida Boulder 1. No. Uh, another cheat. Yeah, just before you export your, export no. your characters out of uh, EOB 1 to EOB 2, use the giant strength potions and when you save it 
it remembers you've got 22 strength when you start the next game. <laughs> Which makes it a damn sight easier. At least up till you reach the uh, Azure Tower. Once you reach the Azure Tower, you have to use a Dispel Magic spell to get past a certain wall. And basically that dispels the strength. So for about half the game, you can have giant strength. Not really supposed to be able to do that. It is kind of hilarious to go onto like the early sections of the game and just cut things in half with one hit. <laughs> oh, I never even tried that. I never, I never bought a party over. I didn't complete. Oh, you know me. I don't complete many games. I've completed one on my channel, and it was a shitty Christmas game on the Spectrum. <laughs> Every other completion on here has totally been Sasamisa. Bugger all to do with me. <laughs> Yeah, it's only because I'm a bit fanatical when it comes to games. And I mean, look at that buff. Look at that uh, Yomu Kampaku in the Dungeon of Loot Creatures. I mean, I've been I've been intending to go back for back to that for quite a while. You know, I just wouldn't stop playing it until I got 100% and ending one. Initially, I thought it was impossible. I even contacted the programmer and asked him if like the game was bugged. And he said, not to my knowledge, it is possible to get ending one. And I did actually finally do it. You not that you get to see the ending, because he asked me to take the ending out of the game. <laughs> <laughs> you have always um, pretty much learned games inside out, though, haven't you? You know, um, analysing everything and learning everything about them, whereas me, I just play them until I get bored, then I move on. Yeah. This cage here, there's a message just before it, you know, cowards will be hunted down and killed. Uh, the first time I got to it, that is exactly what happened. Because basically, if I step off of the square I'm on, all three gates open and ten spiders come out. And basically, hell. I tried to run away, got cornered, and they killed my old party. So basically, stand your ground, open the gates one at a time, and kill the spiders one at a time. Another top tip. Yeah, in Nexus, this puzzle is a joke because the item moves so slowly, you know, you can just back away from them and their attacks just keep missing. The knights were a damn pain, though. They were really strong in Nexus. It was very difficult to actually score a good hit on them. You know, even with uh, strength and fires. I mean, in this, I'm taking these down pretty quickly because the diamond edge cuts straight through them. Oh, Berserk's finally come up. That means I must have reached Expert Fire. So you can just Berserk, they're dead. Well, you get the last piece of uh, the armor of light here. Yeah? And the pair of boats of speed you probably wouldn't miss. Because mm. they're simply just sitting there. You have, of course, got to get to here first to be able to see them. Yeah, you've still got to fight the ten spiders <laughs> that are actually inside. You could just skip this section, but you would miss out on all the extra items and that the all-important pair of boots of speed. But you could just simply skip that section. Yeah, every time you step off that touchpad within a certain period of time, two more spiders regenerate as well. So you end up with you just end up inundated if you try and run away. Right, there's more faders around this corner. There is actually a button there to shut the wall so the spiders can't follow you. So, I mean, there are white, multiple ways of solving the puzzle. You don't have to brute force it. You can run, click that button, and the spiders are trapped. Yeah. But you wouldn't miss out on the items. That reverses the doors. So the door closes behind you and the door opens in front of you. That's the master key, which is the final key to get the fire stuff. That animated hole you saw there going around the room, if you fall through, you end up in a room with a black flame, which is not really a big deal because you can teleport back up. On the ST version, that animated hole slowed the game to a crawl. <laughs> so it was best to actually avoid that room and not go in now. Yeah, the ST version did suffer from uh, slowness issues. Right, I just went back up the east stairs, which is a shortcut back. That was what all those skeleton keys were for. Yep. Right, the three raw keys have opened the the three main doors, so now we're in the Tomb of the Fire Stuff, which is the only level in the game 
that really doesn't have any you know doesn't have any puzzles to solve it's purely just opening doors and getting to the end where the fire staff is there's no real puzzles to solve there are some guardians probably among the strongest Malay fighters in the game and again totally immune to magic in fact they're even more resistant to magic than the knights were you're doing alright for balls yeah I'm saving all them for a reason yeah I have to you don't have to pick them up you don't want to Chaos Strikes Back, they seriously reduced the number of bottles for exactly the reason that I'm going to abuse all the bottles in a minute. <laughs> yeah, Chaos Strikes Back, I don't think you got more than eight or nine bottles in the whole game. Those scrolls give you all various clues and hints on how to unlock the fire stuff, but seeing as I already know how to do it, well, there's a hidden button here, the tiniest of buttons. Bloody hell. I would miss that. Most of the time you do. Uh, in the EOB games, uh, your thief would actually point out stuff to you. You know, if you walk past it. If you had a high enough uh, level. I think your elven characters did as well. Uh, I think they also read their own languages, so when you were on the elven levels, you know, the elf could read the writing on the wall. Right, you've got kind of treasure stores here, but you only got one turquoise key. Well, you obviously want the one with the boots of speed behind it. <laughs> yeah. Right, now you've got all four pairs of boots of speed, which means now you can run like a madman. Bloody hell. Now, obviously, if you had less characters in your party, you say you only had one character, you'd only need one pair of boots of speed to get the extra speed. Trap him under the door and just berserk the crap out of him. No point in using magic. Everything just does so little damage. I think it takes about 60 fireballs to kill him. But yeah, the door and berserk equals he dies in seconds. That's berserk crazy. is an incredibly slow move, but it hits very hard, as you can see. That's it. Dead. Right, best sword in the game. You can dump the uh, diamond edge now. You don't need it. That's basically the Inquisitor, which gives you Berserk. It's actually It actually requires lower skill than the axe to use. As you can see, look, he can't Berserk with that, but he can Berserk with a sword, because it requires lower skill. And now you've got two weapons that can Berserk, which is good for these damn golems. I mean, in AD&D, you know, of stone golems, they were immune to all but plus two weapons, weren't it? It's something like that, yeah. They're pretty much immune to all magic. You know, they need magic weapons to hit, and they, they whack the crap out of you. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much the same in this. An unarmoured character, they can hit you for 300 damage. They nearly always cause injuries when they hit you as well. So, yeah, it just boosts your strength up, and you can take them down with a few hits. Because there's no doors further on. Now the actual area where the fire staff is, you can just grab the fire staff and run. You don't need to fight anything. But I'll take the golems on for the fun of it. The golems in a DM Java were incredibly strong. He made them ridiculously strong. They were practically immune to everything, including your weapons. But they do give you, he does give you a very useful spell, which is hidden in the most awkward place imaginable, which is basically strip defences. And it literally reduces the enemy's armour to zero. So you can literally hit the, uh, you can hit the uh, stone golems and knights as if they had no armour at all. But these enemies here have got 253 armour. So it sounds like a useful spell anyway. Yeah, strip defences. It's just that it's in a really awkward location. <laughs> I think you have to fight a lot of mages and all kinds of crap to get to it. But you notice he was trapped in that alcove. As soon as you pick the fire staff up, they're released from the alcoves. The idea is that you stand there looking at the fire staff thinking, oh, what's this weapon here? And then the two golems pinch you if you're not quick. 
But if you take the golems out before, because you can run around the other side and kill the other one, then open the door. Because there's a master key lock on either side. But they're very slow, just like they were in AD&D. They're not very quick monsters, are they? No. no I mean, they have, in a, well, I wouldn't say inadvertently, but they have borrowed a lot of uh, Dungeons & Dragons type tropes for this game, you know. It's called Dungeon yeah. Master. So. <laughs> yeah, the wizard, wizardry games were the same, Blood Witch was the same. I mean, the Gold Box games, I mean, they all, they're all, I mean, the Japanese RPGs, they all borrow the, they all borrow from the same basic ideas. You know, that yeah. Gary came up with, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but, um, yeah, you, you can you can see a lot of similarities in it. I mean, you know, you look at some of the early Dungeons & Dragons adventures they were. They were literally walking around tunnels like this, you know, um, ten, 10 foot wide, 10 foot square, so many long, there's a room. Corridor going off one way, corridor going e explore and collect and kill. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, the it, wizardry it, games were the same. The only difference is it was turn based combat. Well, that's the wing key. That's hidden again. Very useful, that key. It allows you to shortcut Chaos', chaos is level completely. Well, there's one more golem here. You can't run around this one. You can just lure him into this room I'm in now and don't fight him at all. Well, he, he usually is down this corridor, so you've got to wait till he walks back up. <laughs> Berserk takes him out pretty quickly anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Takes care of him. You know, so now I'm casting 661 because now I've got enough wizard levels to make 6th level Venn potions right down the uh, E stairs and there's where your wing key goes. Right, that shortcutted chaos is level above. This is another way in. But there's something in this large room I'm coming up on which you don't want to tow it out with. A lot of people think this was Andy Jaros's most impressive monster. It's, it's certainly well drawn, but I think the rats are better. <laughs> okay, I'll pass judgment when I see it. Uh, Dean got killed by this enemy instantly. He said he was wandering around, like trying to find a way out. This was after I'd gone home that day, and he said he fell through the hole and something, nope. something come up behind him and killed his entire party with one hit. And I thought, he didn't even get to see what it was. But yeah, when you do see what it is, you know, you see why it kills your party with one hit. But it does have a weakness, which I was quite surprised about. I mean, I worked this out for myself, because if you try to tow it out with him and chop it with weapons and fireballs and your usual spells, it will take you forever. I'm not sure if this was an oversight, because you can't make full bombs, but you can make them potions. Now, the strange thing about Ven potions is they are always cast at maximum power level, no matter what your current wizard level is. Your normal spells, they are cast at your current level, but Ven potions are not. So, basically, make a load of Ven bombs up, freeze life, and chuck them all at him. And <laughs> goodbye, goodbye, dragon. <laughs> He only takes about 10 of them. Normally, you will be hitting him for a while. If he fireballs your party, you're pretty much dead. His bites do quite a bit of damage as well. And yeah, that's the end of the dragon. Bit of a T-Rex look about him as well, isn't he? He is well drawn. Yeah, I know Andy Jarrell said he wanted to give him wings, but there weren't enough space to get him in. In the sprite square. Yeah, you get a ton of them in Carl Strikes Back. There's an entire room with literally... I think like about 12 of them in. Yeah, which is really hilarious for the crossfire. <laughs> <laughs> and when you try to run through the room. But yeah, they drop a ton of dragon stakes. The dragon never regenerates. Uh, they do in Chaos Strikes Back. 
but they're not as strong. I think there's a couple of strong ones, but most of them are baby dragons, you know, like sub adults or whatever. Right, square key. And basically, that's a, a power gem. It told you how to release it. It's okay for us, Bill. And only the fire staff can contain it. Right, if you turn around and chuck that across the touchpad, it doesn't close the wall off, and now you can walk around the whole game with a fire staff. Again, an oversight. Because normally when you walk out of that room, you hit a touchpad and it will close all the walls to the upper levels. So you're trapped, basically, on Chaos's level. It's Chaos is just above. So what you want to do now is make a load more Ven bombs. Because like I said, they're always cast at maximum power level. So when you cast when you cast a 6th level Ven bomb, it's as if you're an Arc Master Wizard. Even though you might only be an expert wizard. But if you cast a Poison Cloud, it will be cast at your current level. Because there's not just the level of the spell, there's the current wizard level as well. They multiply it together. But Ven yeah. bombs are stupidly powerful. Ah, so now the need for keeping bottles has uh, become yeah. apparent. <laughs> now you can see why they took them out of Chaos Strikes Back. There was also the fact that you could carry around way too much water. Because, I mean, if you've got 20 bottles, that's 20 bottles of water. Chaos Strikes Back, the fountains were very few and far between. But yeah, poison in this game, I think, is a little bit too strong. I mean, you compare that to Grimrock, and Poison was... Uh, lightning was probably the best spell, to be honest. <laughs> Considering there was a lot of fire-based monsters in the game. So, I mean, anyone that chose Fireball at the beginning, or Fire Burst, or whatever you start out with, you know, you're going to come unstuck on the later levels because there's a lot of fire-immune enemies. And the enemy at the end of Grimrock, that blasted cube, he happens to be a machine, which is weak against lightning. The second game, the best spell was uh, fire. It was the other way around because you got a lot of ice-based enemies. The programmers thought they'd pull a, pull a switcheroo on you. It's like, oh, you're all going to choose lightning again, and you're cold. So we're going to deliberately have a load of cold-based monsters for no reason whatsoever. Because <laughs> there was no cold cold areas in the game, but they put a load of cold enemies in anyway. <laughs> Made no sense. Weren't like that Eye of the Atlantis mod that guy that guy made that I showed you. He actually had, you know, a, a, a level that was in the mountains where it was all snowing, and it kind of made sense to have cold monsters. But no, the programmers just did that to annoy people, I think. I mean, you don't have a bunch of cold-based enemies, do you? I mean, you think of Secret of the Silver Blades, that was set in the mountains. So you got white dragons, and you got Remorazes, and you got purple worms, polar worms, isn't it? you got lots of cold by stuff. It made sense. But yeah, you want lots of fire shields here because Chaos has got some help. Not quite as bad as Chaos Strikes Back. Chaos Strikes Back, he had a ton of demons helping him, but yeah, yeah he's got some demons. So yeah, basically, same, same order of business. Freeze life, poison them. Demons are very resistant to fire. So don't bother with it. Very resistant to weapons as well. So yeah, poison. Yeah, poison is just too strong in this game. Uh, the fire staff's great for getting rid of the black flames. Just fuse them. <laughs> Kills them with two hits. Nice. I'm not sure if that was a mistake, because fuse is only supposed to affect chaos. But no, it actually affects the black flames as well. You can't open the doors while you're carrying an item, which is kind of annoying. <laughs> Thought that fireball didn't hit me there. Yeah, more poison. Berserker. Hit him with a fire staff. Because the fire staff fires random spells as well. Yeah, I picked up the eye of time on the dragon level. 
I mean, if you didn't have poison, yeah, it would be very difficult to take down the dragon. You know, you'd have to keep freezing in, hacking it with your weapons, and uh, I'm sure it's got hundreds of hit points. I think it's got well over a it's got a few thousand, I think. But yeah, poison makes it kind of a cakewalk. This item, there's a couple of items on that altar there. You've got the Hellion and, which is a necklace, and the Flame It. Originally, there was going to be a super weapon which combined three items into a weapon that, uh, like the Zoe Blade in uh, Skull Keep, but it wasn't implemented. Because there is another item in on uh, the Tomb of the Fire Staff called the Dragon Spit, and that item. Well, the dragon spit was actually the best item in Nexus because it halved mana usage. Yeah, that as long is as you good. were carrying it. Yeah, so basically all your spells instantly took half as much mana, which turned your mage pretty much into a fireball cannon. Yeah, just bomb these. Berserk and poison. <laughs> yeah, and that's the end of them. Use that damn thing. It's a fairly large section. Chaos is wandering around with all these demons, and you've got some black flames dotted around. We yeah, saw the, him in the background earlier, didn't we, Chaos? Yeah, the demons don't regenerate. Uh, the black flames do if you wait long enough. Chaos is pretty much immune to everything. You can hit him with your weapons. Now, you can hit him with magic, but he don't do any damage. I mean, the numbers flash up, but he has pretty much got unlimited hit points. So he cannot be killed that way. The only way is to fuse him with a fire staff, but what you've got to do is surround him with flux cages first. If there's even one... If there's even one gap in the flux cages, he'll escape through it. And he will try to teleport away or when he sees what you're doing. So you've got to be quick. Uh, in a... Dungeon Master Java, there were two ways to kill Chaos. You could either kill him using the Fire Staff, or you could kill him using Stormbringer, which was a stupidly powerful sword that you could find. So you had two two ways of completing the game. A damn difficult uh, DM Nexus was. Uh, not Nexus, uh, DM Java. He really upped the difficulty level. Even if you put it on easy, it isn't. It took me quite a bit of practice to actually do that. I didn't record it the last time I played it. I probably should have done all things considered. What you want to do is get him in the corner. Like that. Wait till he goes in that corner. Stick the flux cages either side of him. Stick one on him quickly and infuse him before he gets a chance to shoot back. Because his spells do hurt. And that basically fuses him and Lord Order together. And you get the Grey Lord back. And that's it, you've done it. Bloody hell. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I was just letting you talk for most of that because uh, it was better to have you explain it. But bloody hell, that is... All right, that's what, two and a half hours of playthrough, but I just... just it just boggles my mind watching you run down the corridors, much like it did with um, Captive. It's like I, I was watching watching the characters at the top, and you you hardly ever run into a wall. You did it a couple of times, but it wasn't anything major. It's like Jesus Christ, man! Oh no! Think about Captive. Is like you can't afford to run into things as much, especially fire and water, because they will damage your droids quite badly. Dungeon Master's a bit more forgiving. Absolute classic game. Yeah, it's a shame the sequel was such a disappointment. I remember, well, for a start, it was delayed a year. You know, there's the first problem. So, I mean, the trouble is, by the time it came out, a lot of people have been sitting around, you know, training their champions, and they had ridiculously overpowered characters. So it made Chaos Strikes Back, especially for me. I mean, I had like Arcmaster characters. So Chaos Strikes Back became a cakewalk. I completed it like within a few days, and I was just so disappointed. 
Thinking, yeah. is that it? We waited yeah. a year for this. Yeah, I remember how disappointed you were. Um, yeah, didn't even see Chaos my first playthrough. <sighs> yeah, because Chaos, well, your mission is not to defeat Chaos in Chaos Strikes Back. It's to throw the four Colbums in the four yard pit. And the first game of time I ever completed it, I never saw Chaos once. He never <laughs> showed up. And it's like, oh my God. And I think the Grey Lord only pops on the screen for about five seconds and then it goes straight to the portraits. It's like, oh my God, it don't even give you a chance to read the message. <laughs> yeah, I remember ST Action. Every month it'd be like, oh no, it's not coming out this month. You know, they're still messing about with it. And then it went quiet for about three months and they never mentioned it. And me and James happened to be in Silica, you know, December. This was like a year later. <laughs> We was in Silica, and there it was on the shelf. And it's like, oh, it's out, is it? <laughs> yeah, ST Action never even told us. Yeah. Yeah. Major disappointment. I'm assuming it's uh, just as disappointing on the Amiga as it was on the ST. Did it even come out on the Amiga? Yeah, it did. Yeah, obviously. I told you, it's got the magic map, hasn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's slight differences. Some of the puzzles are a little bit different. But overall, they are very much the same game. But yeah, it, I think the problem with Carl Strikes Back is don't break the game for yourself. You know, don't transfer over ludicrously powerful characters because it ruins all the fun. You know, as you saw there, I was an average of about a depth expert there. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that that's the kind of party you want. Or just use the party in Chaos Strikes Back. Don't transfer over characters that have got 999 health, 999 <laughs> stamina, and 600 and God knows what mana, because nothing will challenge your party. And you would have ruined your, you ruined your fun. You know, it was exactly the same with the Gold Box games. You know, if you went through, like, Paul of Radiance, and you transferred over, like, eighth-level characters... To curse the Azure Bonds, you're off to a really bad start because your characters are too strong. It takes all the fun out of it. Yeah, well, there are people that just do that to try and get bragging rights of, oh, I completed that and it was easy, you know? Yeah. The only good thing, I suppose, about Cursed, Cur Cursed Secret and Pulse of Darkness was they had difficulty sliders or a difficulty scene. You could change, I think, between, I think it was novice, normal. I can't remember what they called the normal. Novice, normal, and I think veteran or champion. You know, essentially, it, it, it altered the size of the enemy parties and how many hit points they had. So if you had it on, I think it had five settings, actually. I think it was like beginner, beginner, novice, default, you know, uh, advanced and champion, something like that. But if you had it on like the beginner setting, no, baby setting, essentially, the enemies had like 16 hit points and your characters had like 100. <laughs> <laughs> One fireball would literally end the battle instantly. It was kind of hilarious to have like dragons. Yeah, it's supposed to be like 20th level dragon or something. And it's got like about 30 health, which is a very short battle. But if you put it on a champion, the enemies had twice as much, twice as many hit points and the parties were twice as big. So you had dragons with like 400 points. Oh, I think crazy. I did finish like secret on like the hardest level of difficulty. It was just insane. Yeah. And I mean, and then of course, um, there's other dungeon crawlers as well to look at. Now I know we've got um, nightmare, nightmare to do. I mean, yeah. that's a, uh, that's a, what, four and a half hour playthrough. So, um, yeah, and that yeah. was kind of exploiting the engine to go as fast as possible. I mean, if you did it properly and didn't exploit the keys like I did, it'd be more like six. Well, well, that one, for anyone interested, is uh, uh, an up-and-coming video when we get the chance to uh, talk about the playthrough. Um, it's finding four and a half hours in it, <laughs> especially yeah. the way I am at the moment and my hectic lifestyle. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, Nightmare, I would say, is probably right at the other end of the difficulty setting. I mean, you've got Dungeon Master, which is, well, because it was the first of its type, it's kind of nominal difficulty. But Nightmare is right at the, yeah, it's the kind of game that most people start playing and die on the very first section. 
<laughs> yeah, well, that'd be an interesting one uh, to look at. Um, I mean, the monsters are aggressive as hell. They will they will beat you down in seconds. Yeah, well, that one that one is to uh, follow at some point. So, if you like watching dungeon crawler playthroughs with uh, me and Jeff rabbiting over the top of it, keep your eyes out for that one in the coming months. But uh, as far as dungeon master goes. It's a legendary game. Like like I said at the start, it sold a million STs. It's yeah. been on so many systems, and and it is, you know, um, I know you had uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the game now. One where you're being chased by a T Rex on a ZX eighty one, a Monster Hunter or something. Um, oh, three that was mate. yeah, three D maze. That's it. So you you know that was like the first three well, D monster maze. I think it's called, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. the one. Yeah, so you you had that. That was one of the first. It, well, it was the first sort of like you know first person perspective run around a dungeon type game, and it's gone on to this, and it's gone on to Grimrock for this type of game. But these are the games that 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 spawned the first person genre. So for all these people that are into their battlefields and Call of Duties and Dooms and stuff like that, it all comes back to games like Dungeon Master for for making things first person because before that, you know, we're playing platform games and spacing uh, space games like uh, Space Invaders and Asteroids and Galaxian where you're seeing the outside of the ship. But these this is the really the beginning of the walking around in someone else's shoes type game. Oh, yeah. I think so. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I mean, it is it is iconic, you know, not just because of the fact it's sold. I mean, I bought an ST because of it, didn't I? Yeah, you did. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> all right, there were some impressive games on the ST other than Dungeon Master. I mean, we've mentioned Carrier Command. We did a voiceover for that. You know, there's games like Mike Singleton's Midwinter. I was pretty impressed with that. It's been talking about doing a playthrough of Defender of the Crown. Yeah, there's there's there are plenty of other games, but Dungeon Master really was my reason for buying an ST. Yeah, I mean, for getting you to drop a Star Trek game, I mean that is uh that that's quite a thing because I know you're a massive fan of um of of Star Trek in general, well, old Star Trek anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah, to drop that for this just goes to show what an impact this game had on you. And you've 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 told me countless times this is your favourite game, along with Captive. I mean, they're similar games from different well, genres, I suppose. But yeah, Graver pretty much admitted, it, didn't they? I've still got the uh, two-page uh, write-up. I think he did saying that like Captive is basically his experience of Dungeon Master. He was very impressed with it as well. Yeah, well, well, we all were, weren't we? I, I, it's, it'd be hard to find someone, especially within the circle of friends that I had at the time, that weren't impressed with Dungeon Master. Like you say, it was um, Cole that didn't like it, but everyone else at least least had a go and and you know got relatively far. I mean, I only got to about level three or four, but that's that's me, isn't it? I'm you know, I I, I play for fun. I'm not worried necessarily about completing stuff and. It's just a game that, that that drew so many people in, and yeah, it did. It, it sold a lot of STs. You know, I don't. I, I think you would have still got an ST eventually, but um, Dungeon Master yeah. certain certainly put a fire in your feet to go and get one quick. Yeah, it's true. I mean, if it hadn't have been for Dungeon Master, there would have been a lot of other dungeon crawlers. Maybe I wouldn't have played. I mean, maybe I wouldn't have played uh, Dad of Viper. Maybe I wouldn't have played the EOB games that you gave me copies of initially before I bought them in the first year of the apprenticeship. Blood Witch. Blood Witch, I initially poo pooed, didn't I? I yeah. said, oh, the graphics are terrible. Uh, <laughs> I ain't playing this. And uh, again, after a while, I got bored with Dungeon Master and fired up Blood Witch and thought I'd just give it a quick go. And it turned out to be a very good game in spite of how bad it looked. It does look like an 8-bit game, I will admit. It did come out on the 8 bits. But it is two-player simultaneous, and it's five times the size of Dungeon Master. 
it fit on a 364K single-sided ST disc. Well, talking of um, 8 bits, there is a uh, port of either beholder coming to the Commodore 64. I don't know how far along with it they are. I haven't, I haven't seen it for a while, but it was looking good. And I think there's another one. The, the name totally eludes me. But there's another one as well in this style coming out for the Commodore 64. So um, I don't know about the pair of us, but they're games I'm certainly going to be uh, looking at in the not-too-distant future. I think I've looked at... Uh things that you've sent me on YouTube. <laughs> they are pretty impressive for a mere 64. But then again, I mean, is it a 64 these days? I mean, <laughs> what with the added processors, memory, hard drives, sticks, and all that? I suppose it's, it's Vija, isn't it? You know, <laughs> 64 is at the heart of it. Well, I don't know, you know, because there's there's a, a lot of these games that they, they make that as long as they're, they're disc-based, they will run on a bog standard Commodore 64 with a 1541. If if you all you've got is the old stuff, I mean, like you take that Sam's Journey game, yeah, it came on a cartridge, but it also comes on four discs, and you can play it on a bog standard 64 with a 1541. Obviously, um, my 64 is now an Ultimate 64 Elite uh, that I got from Gideon's Logic uh, earlier this year. You know, it's got HDMI out and all that on it, but it's hard. It's FPGA unit. It is an emulation of a Commodore 64 and a really fucking good one as well. So, yeah, I, I suppose coding the games is easier because they can do it on a PC. And I think that, yeah. that goes across the, the whole the whole range of old computers, including, you know, the ST and the Amiga, because... um. It's a lot quicker to fire something up in uh, Win UAE than it is to set an Amiga up and load from floppies or sod about with making hard drive images. So yeah, a lot of the games are now made on on PC for these systems, but you know they do tend to work on the original hardware when when the games are finished. So who knows where they're going with it? But um, the, yeah, yeah. The, the Amiga and the Commodore sixty four and the Spectrum and the Amstrad. I haven't seen much about STs, but for the most part, all these systems are alive and well. Just, you know, it's not 10 games a week now. It's 10 games every couple of months, but they're still coming out. Yeah, I noticed. Al Al does put stuff up on his channel for all the the old systems. I mean, I suppose on the 64, cartridges do help as well, because it allows you to have a game considerably bigger than the 64's original memory. Yeah, well, I mean, you've only got to look at that... um... Sonic the Hedgehog that come out, all right, you need a RAM expansion unit. But all that is is a RAM expansion unit. It's still the same SID chip, VIC-2 chip, 6502 yeah. process, you know, it's, it's still the same stuff running it. So that's good, yeah. Yeah, but I, I think the um, going back to Dungeon Master, I think its true successor, probably well, modern day one, probably was the first Grimrock game. I mean, you know, I was I was quite stunned with that. And he, even though it's not flicking forward, it, it scrolls forward, it certainly had the feel of Dungeon Master about it. Yeah, those, those two mods I played, they really did take me back. It was like with a little bit more polish, you know, maybe put some rats in. You know, <laughs> it, it really would be Dungeon Master. The Carl Strikes Back one was pretty good as well. I mean, I think the thing is, I mean, Grimrock's not so dissimilar from Dungeon Master. It's got a slightly different, slightly different stats system, but it is essentially still the party of four and you still attack with your weapons at the front. You still shoot your magic and your missile weapons at the back. It is essentially the same game. Yeah. Yeah, no, no denying that. You know, it's just like, like, you know, it's had a, it's had a graphical lick of paint and a performance lick of paint, and then you know they've added fire and shadows and particles and all that, all that modern stuff that they put in games now. But it is hot. You strip all that away, it's Dungeon Master. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why it's very difficult to do games like Captive and Blood Witch on it because their engines were so different from DM. I mean, Captive is very much a first person shooter once you get your weapons because they're all range yeah and the same with blood witch blood witch had a very he had a very rigid magic system and a very rigid 
rigid battle system. And for one thing, enemies never regenerate, which means you only get a finite amount of experience the whole game. And that's very difficult to do in Grimrock. Yeah, well, not only that, I mean, if you're doing, um, for example, if you're doing captive, you know, if you're if you're using the Grimrock engine to do a, a dungeon master mod, then you've already got dungeons and and torches and stuff like that. If you're doing a captive mod, then you've really got to redraw all the wall panels, yeah. all the lighting. You know, it, it's completely different. Be interesting yeah. if someone did do it a, a a game, you know, like a dungeon crawler that that was set in space where someone did do a captive mod, but bloody hell, how long would it take them to be able to do everything in captive? They'd be there for a minute. I think games like Vapor and Prove It can be done, but you'd have to seriously speed the game up because Vapor is so slow paced. I mean, I know you're wearing a heavy rig and you're not meant to be running around like <laughs> you got boats of speed, but the game did feel to me like it was slow. I tell you, when I went when I went from Vapor, you know, back to a game like Captive, it was like just zipping around at light speed. It it's a completely different experience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I suppose Vapor, it looks nice. I've I've not really played it. I didn't buy it in the end, but I I, I do keep getting an email from Steam every time it goes on sale, and it's normally about yeah. once a month. Um, I get an email saying oh, Vapor on your wish list is on sale. It's like, well, I would have bought it by now after three years, wouldn't I? So it's not, a, it's not a bad game. It's got a nice story. I mean, I think they've lifted a bit too much from the bio, the, the Bioshock games. <laughs> but it, it does play fairly well. I mean, there are some elements in it I don't like. I don't like the insta-death traps. I don't think they belong in dungeon crawlers. You know, you can't just drop someone down a hole and say, game over. That's just lazy programming. You should fall into a room below. And I haven't got round to the sequel. I took one look at how dark it was and thought, oh, no, no. <laughs> I like to be able to see what I'm doing in a game. I'm not going for all that Tomb Raider nonsense again. <laughs> God, all the Tomb Raider games, except for the first one, because that didn't have dynamic lighting. All the, all the Tomb Raider games, I'm talking about the old school ones here. Yeah. God, they were all so dark. So I couldn't Lara take a damn torch with her. <laughs> Christ. Oh, dear. I mean, seriously, they, they 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 did a torch on the 64, didn't they? You know, in games like uh, Total Eclipse and even as far back as uh, Entombed. You know, you literally turned the torch on, you could move it around the screen and it showed you the light pattern. You know I mean, when did Entombed come out? The 85 or something? Something like that, wasn't it? 85 or 86? But no, Lara Croft, apparently, she goes splunking down a cave and forgets to take a torch with her. (laughs) (laughs) I I know they wanted to show off the flares and all of that, but come on. (laughs) Yeah, that's lighting for lighting's sake, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I I know that was the point of the game. It was supposed to be dark for the suspense and to hide things so they jump out on you and all of that. But sometimes, you know, if you're not going to light your game, it can be a real pain. I know Doom 3 got well slagged off for that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's gone a, a long way in it since. I mean, even then, it's gone a long way from having a torch slowly burning out in Dungeon Master and then casting a light spell or whatever <laughs> and then lighting everything up again. Yeah. Yeah, because I know games like Doom 3 initially, they didn't have didn't have any means of illumination. And everyone was like, this is just intolerable. You can't see what the hell you're even doing. And they put a torch in. I think that you did get a torch, but you couldn't have your weapon and the torch out at the same time. Mm. So you had to switch between them. And then they changed it and made it so you just tape the torch on your gun. Which is what you do anyway in that situation, I'd imagine. I mean, all right, oh, I've, no. never, I've never been down, down a fucking fucking dungeon shooting at demons. But if I did and I had a torch and a gun, I would take my torch to the gun. Either that or you'd have a wrist light or you'd have one on your helmet. You know, it does seem kind of logical, don't it? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Deus Ex, you know, that was literally the mod you started with. You know, basically light. You didn't have to 
find it. You know, JC Denton, he basically started with F12, you know, light. It used minimal power. You could use it wherever you wanted. Obviously, it would tip the enemies off. But illumination wasn't an issue. <laughs> oh, dear. All right, well, seeing as we've uh, drifted quite a bit off of uh, Dungeon Master now, we'll, we'll call that one done. Um, cheers for coming on. That was that was stunning. I mean, I, 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 this is probably the video I've said least in because I was just sitting there transfixed at the screen. Like I said, it was a real a real nostalgia jolt for me. So, yeah, cheers for coming on and sharing that one with us. Yeah, it's not a problem. Until the next video, thank you very much for watching and laters. Yeah, laters. Yeah.